Okay, I guess we should have a microphone on and uh, we should, yes, there is our friend in the box who says everything is okay. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Tom Mooring. I have the honor and pleasure of being chair of the, uh, we call it steering group of the project. That means we are interested partners in the project of Staffan, whom you all know. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all in this room, on the Zoom somewhere, and on the streaming, wherever you are, uh, to this seminar, Electoral Rights and Political Behavior Among Non-Resident Citizens. Uh, myself, uh, a Finn living a considerable part of my life in Sweden today, I am deeply, personally involved in the research we are going to discuss today. Uh, for many Swedish-speaking Finns, the alternative to move to Sweden has proven to be an attractive one. This to the extent that this small group of people, less than 300,000, during this millennium only, has lost or maybe donated almost one-tenth of its population to other countries, mainly to Sweden. So this is a, a most urgent theme. Uh, for the Society of Swedish Literature in Finland, the host of, of, of this seminar here today. The Society uh, has also financed one of the projects to be discussed during the day, Political Behaviour in the Finland-Swedish Diaspora, led by Dr. Stefan Himmelros. And this financing we do as part of our mission to work uh, on uh, humanities, research on humaniora and social sciences. We finance two to three bigger projects yearly with a total sum of uh, about one and a half million euro. Uh, the society also supports young researchers and postdoctoral researchers with grants. Uh, our yearly uh, research uh, budget uh, in, for projects and grants uh, amounts to Christa correct me if I'm wrong, around six to seven million euro per year. Uh, and this year, also an initiative of the society uh, uh, is to uh, finance, together with other finances, 11 projects that start on budgets reaching up to almost one million euro per project. Uh, this is done within the program Future Challenges in the Nordics. Uh, and today, we are privileged to host you all here in the room, Zoom, and on streaming, all of you who have donated to us the time and effort to be here and to uh, support and contribute to the research so greatly appreciate, appreciated by our society and, and, and by us who are uh, steering the project. Uh, as kind of, you know how you steer, you can't push with reins, you can only a little bit turn the horse with the reins. So this is our, our task, but our, our effort and our interest is to listen to you all and to uh, take part and, and, and be uh, uh, privileged by the contributions that you have uh, decided to, to, to make to us here today. A warm welcome to you all.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Tom Morgan, for introducing this day and uh, saying something about the program. And also, thank you to Society of Swedish Literature in Finland for hosting this event. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, one of the projects that is hosting, or actually is part of making up this uh, seminar today. So we have two projects, one of which Tom was mentioned is financed by, by the Swedish literature in Finland. Uh, we will, that will be our main focus in the afternoon. And then we have another project, an EU-funded project, uh, Mobile EU, Mobile EU Electorates and Democratic Participation, which will be our main focus in uh, before lunch today. And it's my pleasure to, to introduce this Mobile EU project to you. Um, my name is Osa von Schultz, and I'm Professor of Political Science uh, at the University of Helsinki, and I'm also the, uh, the leader of this Mobile EU project. Uh, we live in a mobile world. Uh, more and more people move across national borders and decide to live in a different country from which, the which in which they were born. Um, but what happens to our electoral rights and our ways of engaging in politics when moving across borders and deciding to live in a different country? Well, the answer to this is that it varies very heavily on which country from which you move away from. So if you move away from Finland, you might have extensive electoral rights. Uh, but if you move away from a, another country, such as Ireland, uh, you will not have any possibility of voting in your country of origin. And this is a fascinating theme, we think, and particularly considering the increasing mobility within EU, but also in the world at large. So this is what we are looking at in the Mobile EU project, which is, as I said, an EU-funded project. Um, we investigate mobile EU citizens, so we focus on EU citizens' rights, uh, the voting rights held in their EU countries of residence if they move to another EU country, and also their um, electoral rights in their country of origin. And this project responds to a key EU priority of fostering citizens' full democratic participation at all levels. Uh, as I already mentioned, franchise entitlements for mobile citizens and also mobile EU citizens vary substantially within and across EU member states. So this great variation and it, your rights depends on from where, from which country you move. Uh, so our purpose is then to, to look at this and to map this, these rights, the voting rights in national, subnational and supranational elections uh, held in EU countries of residence and of nationality. This is, there's a lot of things to, to focus on here because it's you, your rights in the country of origin and also the rights to participate in politics in the rights to, in the country to which you move. Um, as I said, there is a great variation, and we've tried in this project from the start to, to kind of map this variation in electoral rights. And we've come up with five main groups, which main groups of which characterizes these electoral rights. Well, in the first group, uh, we have wide electoral rights and even special political representation for people moving, living abroad. So there are specific, there is a specific uh, um, district, we can call it, <laughs> it will correspond to a district, uh, with uh, members being elected mainly by, by those living abroad. And this is found in, for example, Croatia, France, Italy, and Portugal. So it on, does not only provide citizens moving abroad with extensive, extensive rights to vote, they are liable to vote, they are liable to stand as candidates. Candidate. Uh, they might also have convenience voting, which actually increases participation to a large extent, but they also have special representation. Uh, 
The next group is those where you have wide electoral rights, so it's easy to participate in politics even if you live abroad, uh, but you don't have any specific representation for, for people uh, living abroad. And that's, for example, Finland, where we are right now. We also find this in Sweden, uh, Austria, the Netherlands, Slovenia. So this is a group, big group of countries. And then we have, further down the list, perhaps a group of narrow electoral rights. There you might be allowed to vote, but not to stand as candidate if you're living abroad. This is, for example, the case in Belgium. The next step of the next group of countries is a group of countries with narrow electoral rights. There's no convenience voting, and you wouldn't be allowed to stand as candidate. That's Poland, for example one of the countries that we focus on in this project. And the last group is the one with countries where there's no electoral rights for people moving abroad and living abroad. So no rights to participate in elections and of course not to stand as candidate either. This is uh, for example the case in Ireland as I mentioned earlier but also in Denmark, Greece, Malta and Cyprus. Uh, so there's clearly a wide variation of rights for people moving abroad and, and which is interesting and puts people in a very different position considering their ability to influence politics in their country of origin. Uh, in, our in our project we focus specifically on five cases uh, and what each of these cases represent one of these five groups. So we have Portugal with wide, the widest electoral rights. We have Finland with also wide electoral rights but no spe special political representation. We have Belgium one step further down in the list of countries with the ex how extensive their rights are than Poland and then Ireland. So these countries uh, represent the full spectra of, of variation in terms of rights. So, In order not to, to make it too complex and look into all 27 countries, we've decided to focus on five only. And that, I can tell you, is enough for us to manage. Uh, within the project we have five core objectives. Uh, one objective is to raise awareness of, of franchise rights of mobile EU citizens. Uh, and we plan to do this, or we are in the making of doing this, by uh, creating an interactive dig digital tool which mobile citizens can use, so like a one-stop shop where they go and they can click on their country and get, they get to know what kind of rights they have, depending on which country they have moved to, so their rights in the, in the country where they live currently, and also in their country of origin. And this takes a lot of work to create such a tool because first we have to gather all of the information on all of these countries. And uh, this is done by our Belgium team. We are already, have already executed that data collection. And now we are in the process of setting up the interactive digital tool. So we are then mapping voting rights of mobile EU citizens across all EU27. And we also look to identify patterns of com convergence and divergence between the regulation that exists. And also then, as I said, to share this data in the interactive tool, but also with other means. Our third objective in this project is to evaluate people's views on this and their awareness of the rights. So we, we are interested in the general population in the five countries that we focus on and, and what they know about voting rights for those moving abroad, but also what they think the, titles the entitlements should look like. So we are interested in the general populations living in the five countries that, that we focus on, but we are also interested in the awareness and the views on these rights of those moving away from these five countries. So we are actually conducting several surveys uh, among the population of both those living in these five countries and the diasporas moving away from these countries, um, looking to, to learn more about the views, people's general views on, on, on these rights. Uh, our fourth objective is to, to provide some evidence-based policy recommendation at the end of the project. 
Um, we, we also seek to collaborate with national electoral authorities and key stakeholders within this area. And uh, to, to increase awareness of, of the variation that exists and also to provide some policy recommendations of what might be fruitful way forward in, in the field. And of course, as our last objective, we have to, to contribute to academic scholarship uh, on political engagement of mobile EU citizens from a transnational perspective. So we are planning several, popula uh, <laughs> several pieces of work in research that we will publish in various arenas. All right, so something about the partners of Mobile EU. So there are three core partners. The University of Helsinki is leading the project, but we have from Belgium, uh, University University of Liège, and we have in Ireland University College Cork. And we have a bit of different, we've divided the, the responsibility within the project for these, uh, between these universities. Uh, but we also have, and these are the project team, part, the people participating in, in the daily work and being responsible for this. So we have from the University of Helsinki, myself, and we have Johanna Peltoniemi and Stefan Himmelros. Uh, University of Liège, Jean-Michel Lafleur, Daniela Vintila, and Carles Pamier. And from University College Cork, Teresa Reedy. And then we have a scientific advisory board, and two of these members are also highly engaged in the project as such. So we have Magdalena Lesinska, who's sitting right here from University of Warsaw in, in Poland, and she's also participating in the, in the daily works almost of, of the project. Uh, we have Dr. Marco Lisi, Nova University of Lisbon, Portugal, who's also here with us in the room, also very much engaged and, and participating in our meetings and, and planning the research. Then uh, we have three other members of, of uh, our scientific advisory board, Professor Eva Östegard Nielsen uh, from Barcelona in Spain, and she will give a talk today, later today. Uh, we are very happy about that and look forward to listening to her. And then we have Professor Isol Hanan from University College Dublin in Ireland and Dr. Eli Heikila, Research Director, the Migration Institute of Finland. And also, and this is kind of important for us, it is very important for us to reach out to those living abroad, the diasporas of the different countries. We have created a stakeholder network that will help us, partly at least that's one of the tasks, to, to help us to, to reach these people. And uh, so we have a, a wide stakeholder network with, with people from the different countries and, and they have different types of tasks and expertise which will, we are very grateful for them being here or being part of our network. Some of them are online today. Um, okay, that was all from Mobile EU. Uh, I look forward to, to some interesting talks today on this topic and, and I hope that we will increase our knowledge on, on this, uh, this fascinating theme. And a disclaimer, of course, uh, the EU is not responsible for what we are saying here today. <laughs> it's fully our responsibility. Um, well, that's it. How perfect on time, I think. All right, thanks. <laughs> Teresa? So good morning everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Teresa Reedy and I'm from University College Cork and um, my role in the project is related to communication and dissemination. Uh, so it is my great pleasure uh, to join you now to introduce the speakers for the rest of the morning. And we are uh, beginning with Professor Reiner Baubach from the European University Institute. And uh, I know that Professor Baubach requires no introduction to many of you here in the room. Um, he's one of the senior figures 
in the field and has been working on this area and leading this area for many years. And that's why uh, we have asked him to really open the session today with a, a scene setting piece uh, in terms of where research is in the field. So he's, the title of his presentation is Mobility and Voting Rights, Normative Theory Questions and Empirical Research Agendas. Uh, but uh, just a, a few words about Professor Baubach before I hand over to him. He is the uh, professor in the Global Governance Programme of the Robert Schumann Centre for Advanced Studies at the European University Institute. Uh, he is corresponding member of the Austrian Academy of Sciences and chairs the Academy's Commission on Migration and Integration Research. Um, and uh, together with Jelena Jankic, who actually has spoken at one of our previous seminars, um, and uh, Martin Wink, he co-directs Global CIT, uh, which is an online observatory on citizenship and voting rights and has been one of the key tools that has actually been supporting and leading us in terms of uh, our research. So it's my great pleasure at this point to uh, activate the Zoom and hopefully uh, welcome, you, uh, welcome you on, Professor Baubach. It will come up. Hello and good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I hope you can hear me well. Perfect. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. The floor is yours, Reiner. Uh, thank you, Teresa. I have to start with an apology, and you wouldn't believe it. Uh, I thought uh, you were in the same time zone as Vienna, so I expected to talk about in about one hour from now. But I've just re switched on on time and realized uh, I'm already in the conference. Uh, so, uh, no chance to see, uh, to test whether the screen sharing works, but I will try to do this right now and uh, hope that uh, you can see now uh, my PowerPoint presentation. Does that work? Okay, I, I, cannot, I cannot hear you. Yes, that works perfectly. Thank you, Reiner. Um, the, okay. the slideshow is not coming up yet, but it might just be a, a slight link. We can see the slides, but it's not going into presentation mode. Yes, I'll start with the presentation mode now. I was just slightly worried because I didn't hear you anymore. Smashing. Uh, Perfect. The only microphone that is working is the one at the podium. So uh, uh, here we go. Without further ado, I'm going to give a very basic introductory talk trying to connect uh, the political theory agenda on mobility and voting rights with uh, empirical research agendas without talking about any empirical research results whatsoever. That will be the task for the rest of the conference, as I understand it. So let me start with uh, the puzzle that has been bothering political theorists for quite a while, uh, and that is uh, who has a right to be included in the demos. Uh, the demos meaning uh, the uh, uh, ensemble of the citizens who uh, have the right to vote or to stand as candidates in uh, representative elections. And basically, political theorists have uh, provided uh, three dif two different answers, and I've been trying to suggest and promote a third one. Uh, one answer is uh, the idea that those who, whose interests are affected by political decisions should be represented in the making of these decisions. Uh, that's called the all affected interest principles. Uh, and the other one is the idea that those who are subjected to the laws have a right to be represented in the making of those laws. Uh, as you can already uh, probably guess, uh, these two principles lead to quite different ideas of who has a right to be included in the demos and to have voting rights. If you say that those whose interests are affected have a right to be included, then that probably stretches very, very widely. Uh, because political interests and political decisions taken in one particular country may reverberate around the globe and will have uh, very often impacts on uh, extraterritorial uh, populations that are not at all connected otherwise with the polity. So this is why the most famous theorists promoting that idea, uh, uh, Robert Goodin has suggested, well, if we take that principle seriously, uh, there is only a global demos. And we have no way to decide who has to be included in particular national demo. Uh, by contrast, those who defend the idea that those who are subjected to the laws have a right to be included uh, through voting rights uh, have tended to think of uh, polities as territorial entities. 
And since those who are present in the jurisdiction and who have uh, residence there are more likely to be comprehensively subjected to the laws to that polity, the conclusion seems to be that all residents in the territory have a right uh, to vote, uh, whereas those who have left the territory who live outside have a much more tenuous claim because they are not subjected to the laws in the same uh, sense. And that would basically strike down the idea of extraterritorial voting rights for experts and for non-residents. The third idea that I've tried to develop in a couple of writings is that uh, of uh, citizenship uh, stakeholding. So the idea that we need to trace the links between individuals and particular polities and see whether their links are strong enough in order to make them members of that uh, polity in a meaningful sense and therefore uh, give them also the right uh, to uh, vote uh, and uh, in, in the elections for the government of that polity. Now, uh, these three principles uh, lead to different ideas of uh, the relation between the citizenry and the demos. The first one is uh, uh, the idea that the demos should really be based on uh, outputs, on uh, the decisions that uh, governments or parliaments are, are taking. And therefore, the scope of the demo should vary from decision to decision. Uh, that would lead, obviously, to very unstable entities that are very unlike the present uh, system of territorial uh, states that uh, we know. The second idea of subjection-based uh, inclusion leads to uh, the idea that the demos are those over whom governments exercise a comprehensive form of rule. Uh, and that, uh, as I said before, uh, casts some doubt on the development that we've seen at least since uh, the last 30 years uh, of much denser extraterritorial and transnational relations between individuals and governments. Uh, and the third idea is the idea that the demos is really a membership uh, conception. It's much it's not directly derived from being ruled. It's not directly derived from having one's interest affected by these decisions. But it's a, a prior idea that you need a demos that has a stable membership that then authorizes the government that exercises these forms of rules. So uh, for that reason, I suggest that democracy as self-government requires a stable uh, territorial polity uh, and a membership-based demos that is roughly congruent with the citizenry. Uh, and we need, therefore, to discuss the question of who has access to voting, voting rights in relation to the question of who has access to citizenship status. The two shouldn't be seen as separate, as they are in the other two con uh, conceptions, but they should be seen as part of the same question. Now, having said that, that doesn't mean that the other two principles are completely irrelevant. For, for example, one could consider uh, an issue-specific demos uh, in referendums. If a referendum is held on the question that deeply uh, affects interests of individuals living across the border, then it would actually be a good idea to involve those other people in a, a referendum that decides that particular issue. Think about a nuclear power plant uh, close to uh, an international border. Uh, but that doesn't mean uh, that the people voting in such a referendum across the border uh, also have the right to elect the government of the country uh, where that decision is taken. Uh, secondly, also the idea of subjection-based uh, demos is, I think, an important one in the sense that being subjected to government power grounds a claim to equal protection and contestation, even if it does not necessarily uh, ground, um, in the sense of being sufficient, a claim to also vote for that government. For example, people who are just temporary residents who have just entered the territory are uh, subjected to the rule of that government. That doesn't mean that they have a right to elect the government, but they have a claim to equal protection of their fundamental rights uh, with the rest of the population. Now, um, this uh, my, my conception of uh, citizenship stakeholding then uh, needs further differentiation by saying that democracies operate at multiple levels. Uh, we should not look only at the nation state, but also at uh, levels of democracy below and above the, the nation state. So we need to specify level specific citizenship rules 
uh, depending on the constellation in which a polity operates. Uh, to make this a little bit more clear, if we look at independent states, those independent states operate within an environment of the international states, state system, uh, meaning an environment of equally sovereign states. In that environment or constellation, it's very, very important for states to have a stable form of membership uh, for their citizens. And that is uh, usually, or in all states, conferred by a birthright acquisition of citizenship status and naturalization in case that people want to acquire a citizenship that they haven't already obtained at birth. By contrast, if you look at other types of polities, for example, municipalities, uh, local communities, they can work uh, with residence-based local forms of citizenship where everybody who takes up residence in their territory becomes more or less automatically a citizen and should actually also have voting rights uh, in local elections, as happens to be the case uh, in many European uh, countries, including Finland, which is one of the 12 countries in the EU where also third country nationals can vote in local elections. And thirdly, we have the type of federated polities, which can be either federal states like my own country, Austria or Germany or Belgium or the US or Canada, or also federated polities above the nation state uh, like the European Union. And in those uh, polities, uh, citizenship is usually derivative. That means it is linked between different levels. I'm a member of the European Union because I'm an Austrian national which means that my uh, EU citizenship is upwardly derivative from my Austrian nationality. Uh, I'm also a citizen of the uh, federal province of uh, Lower Austria, but I am a citizen of that province only because I'm an Austrian national. So in this case, there's a downward derivation of citizenship uh, and uh, voting rights are usually uh, attached to that. So, uh, Let's, let's now look at the electoral rights uh, in this multi-level conception of citizenship. What it means that in national, uh, it means that in national elections, it's quite plausible for states to think of their citizens abroad as still being included in the demos. And this is the big change that we have seen in the last 50 or even 70 years, when more and more uh, countries have adopted voting rights for their nationals abroad. Why? Because their citizens are, be, are lifelong members uh, based on the birthright principle that do not lose their citizenship status when they move abroad and uh, that also retain an unconditional right to return to their country uh, of citizenship. And therefore, they retain a stake in the ongoing politics of that country that makes it plausible to also give them voting rights. By contrast, in local elections, people who move out of the local jurisdiction lose their uh, citizenship status there and therefore also their voting rights. But those who move in acquire, or at least should acquire, their voting rights uh, also if they are non-nationals. Because here we are not talking about national citizenship, we are talking about local citizenship. And therefore, I think the Finnish rule uh, is the right one. Uh, whereas in contrast, for example, in my country, Austria, uh, you cannot vote in local elections unless you have an EU uh, nationality. Finally, in subnational and supranational uh, regional elections uh, of in, in federated polities, it's very often only citizen residents who can vote uh, because of that derivative structure of citizenship that is linked across levels that uh, I have already mentioned before. Now, what does that mean for the context of migration and mobility that is the core focus of your project? Let me just move this a little bit. So, it means that um, in international migration, we have basically three possible answers uh, to uh, the distribution of voting rights. One is the idea that the demos should be congruent, uh, it should be only uh, for citizens and for residents. Uh, and if that is the case, that doesn't mean that migrants are excluded from voting rights, it, but it means that the degree of closure depends on the degree of closure of citizenship laws. So take a country like uh, Canada, for example, where uh, non-citizens cannot vote at any level of elections, but where, where they can quite easily become citizens of the country and encouraged to do so. 
Uh, that is actually a quite inclusive regime. If you look at how many immigrants can vote in national elections, but they can only vote under the conditions that they become Canadian citizens. Uh, by contrast, on the outgoing side, Canada used to be quite restrictive by cutting off uh, the right to vote after a couple of years of residence abroad. Uh, the second idea is that of a transnational demos where the non-resident franchise in national elections is accepted. So citizenship uh, and voting rights are closely tied to each other and you can carry these abroad, but they also means that those inside the country remain excluded unless uh, they acquire citizenship. Finally, there is the uh, conception of a post-national demos, which is the uh, converse of the transnational demos. Uh, that has been advocated by many progressive political theorists uh, that says it's actually not, uh, we are not advocating the non-resident franchise, we are advocating the non-citizen franchise, uh, but we see this actually realized in uh, real world democracies, mostly at the local level. There are only very, very few countries in the world, we have counted five, that also grant a non-citizen franchise in national elections independently of what kind of nationality these people uh, have. There are a few countries that grant uh, non-citizen uh, voting rights uh, based on reciprocity, for example, between Brazil and Portugal, but these are special cases. So uh, this is the solution. These are the possible solutions for international migration. Now there is, since it's, this comes up in the title of your project, a, a problem with mobility. Mobility meaning, uh, short-term migration that does not necessarily lead to taking up long-term or permanent residence in another country. And uh, this is a serious question. How can they be included in the demos and represented in uh, democratic elections? My answer would be for short-term abs absentees, uh, it's obvious that their strongest claim is for representation in the country of origin. So uh, they should have uh, voting rights in the country of origin, but actually we do find a couple of cases, for example, Italy, where paradoxically the long-term uh, expats uh, and those who have inherited the Italian citizenship by ancestry have voting rights in Italian national elections, whereas the Italian Erasmus students uh, who uh, uh, happen to be elsewhere in Europe uh, lose their voting rights in national elections. That has something to do with uh, the discrete representation where Italy and other countries have created special territorial, extraterritorial constituencies for the non-resident citizens. And it's hard to include the temporary absentees in these extraterritorial constituencies because they don't take up residence there. Uh, a second problem is with, with regard to supranational mobility and the need to avoid uh, the loss of franchise through the exercise of free movement, as can happen uh, in the European Union, if your country of origin cuts off your voting rights in national elections after uh, some time of residence abroad, uh, and your country or your host country doesn't give you access to uh, its citizenship or to its voting rights, uh, except under conditions of naturalization that many EU citizens might find unattractive. So uh, here again, I think it's very important that, that uh, mobile uh, citizens uh, within the European Union or similar regional uh, uh, unions of states do not lose voting rights. They have claims to vote either in their country of origin or in their country of residence, but probably not in both at the same time, because that might count as some form of double voting uh, in national elections that could be seen as problematic in a politically integrated uh, regional union. Finally, there is the problem of hypermobility of people who move back and forth between countries without uh, any uh, developing any pattern of long term residence in any country. And there uh, is uh, a real problem of how to adequately represent them in territorial polities. Uh, and probably we need to find something like vicarious forms of representation for these temporary migrant workers with recurrent migration patterns that otherwise fall into the cracks uh, uh, be, uh, between, uh, of, an, uh, of a territorially organized international state system because of the very fact that they don't fit because of their hypermobility. Now, let me conclude very quickly since I probably have already spoken for too long. 
uh, about the empirical research agendas that may uh, build on uh, these uh, theoretical reflections and hopefully will take them into account. On the one hand, uh, we need large in uh, comparative research on uh, the laws and policies of uh, citizenship uh, and voting rights. And this is the main ambition and task of the Global Citizenship Observatory that Theresa already mentioned, that uh, Jelena Jankic, Joe Shaw, Martin Fink, and I jointly co direct. Secondly, we need also small and comparative and case studies on the politics of migrant franchise uh, in to try to find out who pushes for extensions or retractions of the migrant franchise in these various forms and at the various levels. Uh, and uh, who is interested in this for what reasons, uh, uh, which you cannot easily do uh, in a large N uh, survey. Uh, thirdly, uh, apart from studying uh, the politics and the outcome of the politics in terms of the laws, uh, it's very important to study also political behavior uh, of migrants once they are enfranchised. And before they are enfranchised, we need to study their migrant activism in, in terms of claims making for citizenship and electoral inclusion. We need to study their electoral turnout, where they actually enjoy voting rights. And we need to study what they do when they have a choice between voting here or there, meaning in their host country or in their country of origin. A third uh, important uh, research agenda is to look at political representation, the outcome of elections, um, and also the composition of party lists. So how often do migrants or uh, persons of migrant origin uh, show up on uh, electoral lists? How often do they actually win seats? Uh, how strongly are, are they represented in electoral assemblies and in government bodies? Uh, this is something that has been done, uh, you know, of course, for the representation of women of other types of minorities. But uh, this study, this type of study is probably still in its infancy when it comes to uh, the representation of migrants. And fifthly, and finally, there is a research agenda on studying public attitudes uh, towards alternative franchise models and the migrant vote. In democracies, uh, you need to convince majorities of citizens and those who represent them uh, if you want to uh, promote progressive franchise reforms. And there have been interesting surveys uh, recently done by Joachim Platter and his team and, and some others that show that uh, surprisingly, uh, the attitudes towards expansions of the migrant franchise, at least in Europe, tend to be somewhat more open than we assume based on uh, media reports. Now, this is, uh, I think, uh, already my, my final slide. Uh, I think the, we need to merge the three uh, compar these comparative research agendas on citizenship and franchise laws. Uh, uh, there are, so far, the literature has been deeply divided. Uh, there is one literature that studies migrant voting rights in the immigration context, so the non-citizen franchise. And there is another literature <clears throat> that comes out of diaspora studies and transnationalism studies that has an emigration centric agenda. But it's very important to combine the two and to see which countries uh, do both uh, expansions uh, towards the non citizens and towards the non uh, residents and uh, what are the patterns internationally in, in that regard. And this is what we try to do now with a new data set on the Global Citizenship Observatory. Uh, that uh, um, we developed jointly with uh, two uh, research assistants. I think one of them is also here in, there in Helsinki. This is Sebastian Ompieres, and the other one is Claudia Wegscheider. Um, this, these are the agendas that look only at the voting rights uh, and uh, the candidacy rights. But it's very, very important to connect this agenda for the reasons that I've mentioned above with uh, access and loss of citizenship status itself. We cannot really say much about uh, the uh, access of migrants to uh, voting rights without considering also the alternative route of a change of their citizenship status that gives them then a different bundle of voting rights than they had before. So uh, it's a frequent mit mistake, especially in the immigration centric uh, agenda, studying only the non-citizen residents uh, to um, 
consider migrants only as non-citizens. Migrants can also become citizens, and after they have naturalized, they are still of migrant origin. And uh, naturalization is a way of uh, giving them uh, the power to vote uh, that is alternative or complementary to whatever uh, voting rights for non-citizens a country may introduce. For all of these linked research questions, we also need to not just comparative data across the world on both the non-residents and the non-citizens, but we also need longitudinal data, because otherwise we cannot possibly study uh, the patterns and trends and how they change over time. And we need to study also the differences between levels and types of elections, such as municipal and national elections or presidential and parliamentary elections uh, or the difference between voting rights and candidacy rights. And all of this we try to capture in this big matrix uh, of our current uh, project on uh, electoral rights of migrants. Um, I will probably, uh, for the sake of time, just uh, stop my presentation here so that uh, there is still uh, some time for, for Q&A. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Reiner. Um, that, that was uh, an excellent conceptualization of the central concepts in the field, uh, but also a rather research, uh, uh, ambitious research agenda that you have set for uh, all yourself and all of us in the room in terms of what we need to be doing for the next number of years. And I very much hope somebody from the European Commission is online as well, who is listening and, and perhaps has uh, some capacity to provide the uh, infrastructure and, uh, and uh, funding that will help us uh, with all of the uh, fabulous research questions that you have set out for us. So we have uh, two sets of um, participants we have colleagues online and we have colleagues here in the room in terms of managing the, uh, the Q&A. So uh, I might throw the floor, up to, uh, floor open to colleagues in the room in the first instance, if anybody has any uh, questions for, for Reiner, uh, and then perhaps pass to my colleague at the end of the room who will uh, address any questions um, if they come in on Zoom. So the chat function is open on Zoom, so if anybody online would like to pose a question, please do, uh, please do place it there. So within the room, is there anybody who'd like to, uh, like to get us started? We have a microphone, so just uh, if you wait a moment um, for the microphone to come to you, who'd like to, uh, to kick us off? I think you have uh, challenged a room with the uh, ambitious uh, research agenda. Uh, Reiner, I might actually start by asking you perhaps for your advice and guidance on how we might connect immigrant out and immigrant in research agendas, because that's something we have struggled with in, in the project um, in terms of just the, the enormity, I think, of the data that would be available to us and, and kind of how we could go about actually operationalizing that research, uh, that research agenda. I don't know, would you have any advice or guidance for us on that point? Uh, thank, thanks for that question, Teresa. That now depends really on what the object of your study is. If it is, uh, as in the case of the Citizenship Observatory, laws, the, the legislative output, then uh, it's clear that you have to uh, just collect these laws uh, and uh, before you connect them, you have to see what legislation was passed on uh, the non-citizen franchise and on the non-resident franchise, and then try to code these laws to make them comparable at the international level and also across time, and then study the patterns that you find through statistical methods. Uh, if your focus is, however, on the individual, right, and how they exercise their transnational political agency and participation, then uh, you probably uh, have to do surveys. And uh, in these surveys, you have to ask both types of questions. You have to ask the question here and there. Uh, uh, you know, as, as, as now there are quite a number of researchers who have done this. We have uh, studied um, uh, migrant communities uh, through survey methodologies, uh, uh, trying to find out 
what would uh, how often do they participate in home country elections and in host country elections presuming that they are enfranchised uh, and uh, why do they do this what are their motivations what are their expectations uh, connected to their political participation you can do the same also at the meso level uh, looking at organizations uh, if you look at uh, social movements uh, for campaigning for an expansion of the franchise and there you will again very often find uh, the division you will find organizations that campaign exclusively for the non-citizen franchise in the host country and diaspora organizations that campaign exclusively for the non-resident franchise in the country of origin so then again you need to uh, combine these two studies and maybe even set up a dialogue between these organizations if you want to do something a little bit more experimental. So uh, I, I think th this is the basic answer, you know, depending on what your research object is, whether you want to study the policies uh, or the individuals and their behavior, uh, you need to apply different methodologies. It's just the perspective is important to keep in mind that the people we are talking about, the migrants, lead transnational lives, at least in the first generation. And therefore, it cuts off an important part of their experience and lives if you look at only uh, their host country uh, connections or only their origin country connections. Thanks so much, Reiner. In relation to the project actually we're working on, um, we are looking at individuals and in fact yesterday we had quite a lively and long discussion about how you reach these populations. That's probably the single biggest barrier that we're, our challenge that we are facing uh, in our project is actually reaching these, these exact communities and, and kind of collecting a, a representative sample. It's, it's a fascinating uh, but very challenging field of, uh, of research. Um, for us. Can I uh, come to the, the audience, uh, come to you first, Stefan, please, if you, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you for a very fascinating uh, talk. Uh, I, I have a question about the stakeholder concept and how, and how far we can, we can stretch it. Uh, so, uh, for example, can second generation migrants also be stakeholders? And I'm, I'm thinking about the project that, I, that we will be presenting in the afternoon, where, where we are looking at, at, at Swedish-speaking Finns. And, and there we have uh, included in our data people that are second generation and that have never lived in Finland, but identify very strongly with Finland, and especially with the, with the language groups of, of Swedish-speaking Finns. Are, are they stakeholders? So <laughs> Thanks, that, that, that's a very good question. So, you know, <laughs> coming back to our previous discussion about the dual perspective, there are obviously stakeholders in the host country, right? So uh, we should assume that uh, they uh, have a claim to uh, not just voting rights uh, as non-citizens, but basically citizenship state in the host country. Uh, that's the first and most important thing to say about the second generation. So a, some kind form of conditional use solely, I think, uh, is uh, really required for the, the second generation to uh, honor their stakeholdership in the country where they've been born and raised and where they will uh, live most of their lives. Now, with regard to the relation to their parents' country of origin, uh, <clears throat> as, you, as we know, uh, they inherit their uh, parents' citizenship in virtually all cases. So one of the uh, one of the most common rules in citizenship laws across the world is second generation use sanguinis uh, outside the territory. All states, including the so-called pure use solely states uh, in uh, North and South America, do give uh, their citizenship to second generations born outside their territory. Uh, to parents uh, who are the citizens of these countries of origin. Now, why is that the case? Uh, obviously, because as long as these children are minors, most of their lives will be governed by their parents, uh, including the decision where they will spend uh, the, much of their lives, whether and how often they go back to their countries, uh, to the parents' countries of origin, whether they even return for good together with their parents uh, to that country, 
And for that reason, it's terribly important that they have also the citizenship of their uh, parents' country of origin, uh, because otherwise, you know, you might face a situation where the parent has a right to return, but the child doesn't. And that would be, uh, you know, uh, an, an unjustifiable intrusion uh, with the right to private and family life. Now, what happens then at the age of majority or even earlier if uh, voting age uh, is earlier than, uh, than 18? Should these uh, um, second generation children also uh, acquire automatically the extraterritorial voting rights for non-residents that their countries of origin grant their parents' generation? Uh, and here my answer would be uh, a little bit more ambivalent. In cases where these children have not returned uh, to that country of origin with their parents, where they know it basically just from their parents' storytelling uh, or, or occasional visits during summer, it's not really plausible that these children have built up uh, a strong link to that country of origin that is strong enough to also entitle them to determine the political future of that country through their votes. So uh, I would be in favor of a rule that says they have the citizenship of the country of origin, but whether or not they acquire the voting right in the country of origin of their parents should depend on their own biographies until that time. Uh, and if they return to that country uh, as citizens, they should automatically, of course, they, they will automatically pick up their voting rights again. If they live there for a time and then go back to their, their host country, they should not lose their voting rights because they've re-established a connection that makes them also familiar with the politics of that country of origin. But in cases of permanent uh, settlement of second generations in a host uh, country, uh, I would be in favor of phasing out the voting rights already in the second generation. Uh, and phasing out citizenship transmission, at least uh, at the interface between the second and the third generation. Thank you so and much. And I think actually the Scandinavian countries, if I may add to this, uh, have a, uh, developed formulas that approximate that idea because uh, second generations do not retain automatically the voting rights independently of their, uh, of their migration patterns or their declaration of a desire to retain the link uh, or to return to the country of origin. Thank you so much, uh, Reiner. Th that is actually a, a live debate, not just in, in the Scandinavian countries, but also in the case of Ireland, where, of course, there are 3 million passport holders, but 70 million in the Irish diaspora. So the question of the point at which uh, you lose voting rights is, is a very uh, live one indeed. I'm, I'm going to draw the first presentation to a close at this point. Reiner, sincere thanks for joining us from Vienna this morning. We hope that you can stay with us for some of the morning at least, uh, but it's been a great pleasure having you with us. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you most especially for setting out the field and, and leaving with us with such challenging questions for the remainder of the day. So thank you very much. So I'm not sure if you can hear the, the, uh, the applause. At this point, um, I'm very pleased uh, to uh, hopefully introduce our second speaker, uh, Professor Eva Ostergaard Nielsen. I'm especially pleased to have uh, to introduce Eva because she is actually a member of our scientific advisory board. Uh, so we are delighted uh, that she is able to uh, be with us uh, this morning uh, and to uh, speak to us. The, uh, Eva is a professor of political science at Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona. Uh, her main uh, research interests, obviously, are comparative politics. No surprise. Uh, also, of course, migration and uh, democracy, and she is currently the principal investigator on a European Research Council-funded project, uh, Migration and Democratic uh, Diffusion. She has uh, published very widely uh, uh, on this topic and has been very supportive uh, of the, the project. So we're delighted to have her with us this morning. And the title of her presentation is Absence Makes the Vote Grow Further, Emigrant Voting Patterns in Homeland uh, Elections. And I know that she's going to be picking up on many of the points that actually have been raised by Reiner in terms of his research agenda setting uh, presentation. So you're very welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, Eva. And I'm going to hand the floor over to you if you want to share some slides. Perfect. They've come up there for us now. All right, let me just... Perfect. 
Perfect. Yeah, can, we, we can see you and we can hear you. You're very welcome. Thank you. And you can see the slides as well, I hope. Yes. Um, thank you very much for this kind introduction and, of course, for this invitation to participate in your exciting workshop. Um, I'm sorry not to be able to be there in person, but um, I hope I'm not known for my technological skills, but, you know, I hope this can, can come across nonetheless. So um, I'm very excited to present this morning in the context of this workshop because really um, uh, following the project and also listening to the introduction this morning, I think there are a great number of synergies between what we do in the Migra Demo project um, and what you are doing in terms of the mobile EU uh, research. So what I wanted to present today um, is a paper called Absence Make the Vote Grow Father, Immigrant Voting Patterns in Homeland Elections. And I need to emphasize very strongly that this is joint work within the team. Um, with Lawrence Go, Nicolas Fleece, and Irina Chone. So basically, in the Migra Demo project, we are looking at, at um, how the um, migration might entail processes of democratic diffusion back to countries of origin. We're looking at the micro foundations of these through mainly research in countries of origin, household surveys. Um, qualitative interviews with both um, what we call individuals and also members of civil society and parliaments that have a migration experience. But uh, we also have a work package that focus on the emigrant vote. And this work package um, has taken on a slightly bigger part of the project than was initially envisaged um, for many reasons, including also the lack of access to field work during the pandemic. Um, and basically what we're asking in this part of the project um, is what's happening in migration. Um, or sorry, is the, what's happening with the immigrant vote? Is it different from the homeland vote? And if so, is it due to political resocialization in countries of residence or other factors? And so basically what I'd like to do today is first talk a little bit about the theoretical underpinnings of what we're trying to do, then present the immigrant voting pattern data set that we are near completion of, of collecting data for, some preliminary findings on how and why the immigrant vote differs from the vote in the country of origin, and um, some examples on which parties immigrant uh, vote from afar and, and the research agenda that we're currently engaged in around that. So, oh, this comes like this. Um, so why the focus on the immigrant vote? I think this has been nicely set up already by the first presenters. Uh, there is an increase in migration. There is an increase in immigrant enfranchisement. Um, from what we understand since 1990, we have an increase from 35 uh, or 37 countries giving immigrants voting rights in in 1990 and now 135 countries and counting. The immigrant vote uh, is not interesting because of the impact on the outcome in the elections in the homeland. We have fairly few examples of the immigrant vote actually changing who gets to govern after the election. But instead, as has already been highlighted, um, it speaks to the relationship between mobile citizens and representative democracy, overlapping electoral arenas, the increased agencies of actors involved in this, such as the parties abroad literature that I think we're also going to be hearing more about later this afternoon. And of course, it speaks to if and how political preferences towards the country of origin change in migration. It speaks to the processes of political socialization. It speaks to the idea of dual embeddedness that Raina also um, talked about at the more theoretical and normative level. The, the, the immigrant vote as a measurement of, of what happens with this dual embeddedment of, of people who live in one place, but still also um, have a, a voice in politics in their homeland. So in terms of political resocialization, um, and I apologize for those who've already listened to a, a previous presentation earlier this spring around these, these issues, um, this is one of the, of the underpinnings of, of this discussion, right? So if political resocialization refers to the process through which individuals learn their political behavior and establish political orientation, attitudes, beliefs, and values related to the political system, then within that literature, we have a longstanding debate in terms of whether the 
we're dealing with early socialization. So you sort of, in your formative years, um, establish your political preferences and that stays with you versus the lifelong socialization where you can change over time, you can have cohort generational effects and exogenous shocks that might explain changes in, in, um, in, in political behavior and, and attitudes. And so in terms of how of migration, um, the idea is to, in this literature, to look at whether you mainly can identify um, a pre-migration outlook among migrants, uh, or you can identify processes of resocialization. And there is a fairly large literature that points to processes of, of political socialization or resocializations in countries as a resident with different variables such as time spent abroad makes a difference. The age of migration um, makes a difference. Where you come from makes a difference. And also, um, of course, with the transnational uptick in migration studies since decade, that migrants don't make a cut with their country of origin. So their transnational ties and their dual embeddedness make a difference. And so how does this, so these are studies mainly focusing on how migrants change in the countries of residence, often with a dependent variable related to the country of residence. But of course, there's also a large literature that deals with how that translates back into um, um, engagement and, and orientation outlook in terms of the politics of, of the country of origin. So we have the migration and democracy literature, the studies of indirect impact of migration on countries of origin, we have the concept of social um, remittances. So the idea that migrants from afar um, send back social remittances that somehow are different than what you would have in the country of origin and, and therefore contribute um, in this way. Or studies of return migration um, that show also um, try to point out to what extent that migrants have sort of absorbed their political environment uh, during their migration experience. And then we have, but I totally agree with Reiner and, and also I'm very excited to hear um, more about the mobile EU findings on this. We have some data on attitudes and voting behavior of migrants here and there. Um, um, but moving on, uh, we also have data, uh, we also have studies that are based on aggregate data, which is where our research comes in in terms of the EVP data set. So aggregate data being um, the whole, you know, what, what do the, 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 the Finnish wrote from Sweden, um, we have studies per country of origin, especially um, the co-authors Turju and Urbac, who have published a series of papers over the past years that show that immigrants tend to be more supportive of green parties, less supportive of populist parties, etc. But we also have papers that, and, and oh, sorry, research that break this down per country of residence to look at the destination effect, um, such as the studies of Fitmurch and Doyle, Sholin and Sevieral. The, um, the characteristics of these papers though, is that they tend to focus on fewer countries of origin. Um, uh, Mm, sometimes with a particular regional focus. And then we have um, upcoming studies and new studies on the dual embeddedness. That is, to what extent migrant, the immigrant vote takes its cue both from political events in the country of residence and the country of, of origin. But I think the point is there are things we still need to further unpack and understand. Um, so one obvious elephant in the room tends to be self-selection and migration. So if the immigrant vote differs from the vote in the country of origin, is it because of who leaves and not about what happens after people leave? And the second point is that processes of political socialization and migration can be complex. So there has been a a tendency in the migration and democracy literature to focus on democratic remittances. So if people move from less to more democratic countries, to use these kind of fairly crude terms, then um, those social remittances would be more pro-democratic. But um, one of my um, um, previous uh, PhD students, uh, Seda Aydin, who defended in 2019 studying uh, Turkish return migrants from uh, Turkey, uh, sorry, in Germany, going to Turkey, came up with the concept of negative political socialization. 
as a way of also designating processes where migrants might be socialized to feel outside of the system of their country of residence. And finally, I think it's important to point out that dual embeddedness can be complex. We cannot assume that the studies that demonstrate processes of political socialization in countries of residence translate into immigrant uh, voting behavior. And here, um, I don't know if I have time, but um, one of my very first interviews almost 30 years ago uh, was with Turkish origin local councillors in Denmark. And um, something that made an impression on me was that one of the councillors in Copenhagen who had run for the Social Democratic Party um, gave me the story about how the Social Democratic Party was saying, what do you need for your campaign? Um, just tell us, would you like us to invite um, one of the important politicians from Turkey, from the Turkish at the time, Social uh, Democratic Party to stand next to you in your on your campaign trail? And he said, no, 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 that would be the end of my campaign because while Turkish origin voters will vote for me in local elections because I stand for the Social Democratic Party, when if they were ever given voting rights in Turkey, they would vote um, for a completely different party. So I cannot stand next to a Social Democrat from, from Turkey, I can stand next to a Social Democrat from Denmark. And what I'm trying to say is that we need to question this idea of how processes of political socialization and dual embeddedness might be more complex than, um, than we think. So in terms of the immigrant voting pattern data set, um, just a couple of slides to present this. This is a data set that is hand collected by the micro demo team, both the, um, the, the full team members, but also a long list of research assistants that have been helping us out. We've surveyed more than 100 countries with immigrant voting rights. Uh, on average, we have, um, so, so now we have 41 countries of origin, 177 elections, which is on average four elections per country. And what we've done is that we've included the vote for all political parties in each election from 2000 to 2019 across these countries, both in the country of origin and for each country of residence. So what we've been striving to do uh, is to have a balanced distribution across global regions. Um, we're still missing some because we can only include, because we're looking at the destination effect, we can only include countries which actually have um, or want to share um, data on what is voted from each country of residence. Um, and around a third of the elections are still from EU member states. In terms of the uh, geographical distribution of the countries of residence, um, also more than a quarter have residence in EU member states, but we do have a fair distribution across other regions as well. On average, we have 55 countries of residence per election with a minimum of one and a maximum of 161. And finally, what we were also trying to do is to include different types of um, political systems in the data set. So um, even so, <laughs> the data set is largely composed of democratic countries of origin. Most moves are to more democratic countries, but the data set still also covers migration to less democratic countries. So in terms of the analysis, we have tried to ask different questions to this data set over the past year and a bit. And basically, um, what I'm more comfortable at sharing is the first part of the analysis, where we mainly ask, does the homeland vote change in migration? And so the first hypothesis for this analysis is um, to say that political distance, which is measured as the difference in scores of level of democracy across the country of origin and residence, is correlated with a difference in the vote from abroad and at home. So the larger the political distance between the country of origin and residence, the larger the difference in voting patterns and vice versa. And the second hypothesis is that for migration from less to more democratic countries, there is a significant relationship between this political distance and the difference in the vote at home and abroad. So what's important to emphasize is that here the dependent variable is the vote difference, but that's the absolute value 
um, in the vote share difference between the country of residence and the country of origin um, at a specific year for the, for the winning party. And the independent, the main independent variable is the political distance, which at this stage of the analysis has been measured by polity, although we're also going to try this out with VDEM. So without going into the modeling too much, I think just to share the um, main results, What's important to um, maybe emphasize is that the way it's set up, we have uh, year fixed effects and pairwise country of origin and country of residence fixed effects. Um, so this still means that there are things we can't control for, um, pairwise or country specific things that change over time, um, but it's still an analysis that tries to control quite tightly um, for, for uh, for, for things that are particular to the countries and the, and the pairs of countries. And what we've found so far is that indeed there is um, a significant relationship between political distance and difference in the vote from abroad and in the country of origin. And indeed, these findings are um, to a large extent driven by movement from less to more um, democratic countries. And I'm happy to come back to this more in the, in the Q&A. Um, but the next step is to have a look at which parties do immigrants vote for. And here what we're doing is that we're merging the EDP data set with B party, um, something that I had hoped we were done doing for today, but it is really a very, very um, difficult exercise to match the party codes across the, the two data sets. But once this is done, the analysis will speak to the issues of migrants as actors of change. So for instance, do immigrants vote for more dem pro-democratic parties, more pro-gender parties, et cetera, than, than homeland voters? We do have some preliminary results that I presented in a previous seminar, um, but we also felt that these results needed further analysis. So what we've done since then and what we're still um, what we're just now finishing doing is that we have expanded the data set to include more parties so that we're not just looking at the first three parties, but the whole uh, list of parties that have been voted for um, at home and abroad. So anecdotally, um, there, are cases that, there are cases that are spoken about in terms of the complexity between especially the dimension of uh, whether the difference in the immigrant vote and the homeland vote is due to political socialization or self-selection. The case of Turkey has been highlighted um, that the support for the, um, for the AKP was stronger among Turkish voters residing in several EU member states than it was in the country of origin. Another case that has been highlighted is Romania where there has been a tendency in a series of elections for the immigrant vote to support being a vote of change, supporting the opposition, and not least opposition with a, um, an anti-corruption um, political campaign. Other cases that we've looked over include Paraguay in 2018, where the immigrant vote was a vote for change. Um, the immigrants supported the PLRA, while the incumbent ANR Colorado Party won at home. But really, the example that I also wanted to highlight, uh, not least because we published a blog post in the Migra Demo Project uh, a couple of days ago, written by Lawrence Go, is the Philippine election in 2022. So 22 means it's not part of the EDP data set, but it's still a very interesting um, example, I think, of, of illustrating the complexity between this issue of self-selection or political socialization. So as you may know, in the case of the Philippines, um, 1.77 million overseas Filipino voters could, um, workers can vote in homeland elections since 2003. 57.5 uh, of those reside in the Middle East, 17.7% um, in Asia, and the profile of these migration flows is mostly low skilled. Now, the 2022 election in the Philippines was, um, was interesting because the, the, the main candidates, uh, the presidential candidates, was on the one hand, Marcus Jr., the son of the former dictator, and on the other hand, Lenny Robrero, who um, had a very different profile in terms of 
what one could term maybe pro-democracy, anti-corruption um, issues. But what happened is that in this election, uh, the turnout for the immigrants was, I think, not low. It was 36.5, which is not unusual um, in, the, in the case of immigrant voters. And the support for Marcus Jr. was much higher than the support for this candidate um, in the homeland. So 72.7% voted for, for Marcus Jr. from abroad. But it also shows some of the destination effects uh, or maybe the self-selection effect in the sense that um, in, the, in, in his analysis, Lawrence shows that migrants residing in less democratic countries were more likely to support Marcus Jr. Again, and I think Raina pointed this out very well, um, just looking at one election also doesn't, doesn't tell the whole story. Um, again, in the blog post, Lawrence goes back several elections to show the complexity and also the volatility of the immigrant vote across these elections. So just to quickly wrap up, um, I think uh, these were just examples and our aim is to, uh, our objective is that in order to further unpack these issues, we need more data-driven research and um, we're hoping that setting up this more global data set will allow us to explore further some of these dynamics. For now, what we feel kind of comfortable in saying is that political distance matters. The more different the host environment, the more divergent our voting patterns. Direction of migration matters. Results are driven by migration to more democratic countries of residence. But we need more work now on the direction of the immigrant votes. Is it um, a vote for change in terms of whether immigrants vote for the incumbent or the opposition? And um, the V party has a whole series of variables also in terms of whether the parties are pro-democratic, pro-gender equality, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea is that this will allow us to further unpack the destination effect processes of political socialization and how um, this translates into migrants as actors of change also at the ballot box. But um, I think, again, just to highlight that this is where there are uh, a number of synergies with the Mobile EU project and uh, the different methodologies that you are um, applying to answer, to some extent, some of the same questions around this. Um, on our side, we look forward to present the results with the merging of the EVP data set in EPSA in June 22 and ECPR in, in August. And with this, I think I will hold here and look forward to if you have any questions or comments on this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ava. That's absolutely fabulous. I think it's, uh, it's uh, um, extraordinary to hear you talk about how much more data you want to collect, because from our side, sitting here, listening to the data you have already, it's absolutely magical. It's fabulous, uh, uh, fabulous material that you have. And thank you so much for being with us this morning to, to, share, uh, to share that. Um, we have time maybe for one quick question or two. Um, is there anybody who wants to, uh, uh, to get the conversation going? Anybody who, who wants to, to start? For myself, I have a very quick question. I, are you collecting I ideology data where, where voters are on an ideological scale um, in terms of left and right or liberal and conservative in addition to the kind of democracy attitudes? Are, are, do you have ide ideological questions? Um, just really quickly, so we're not talking to anyone in the EVP data set. We're just collecting data on the vote. Um, however, once this data is merged with the V party da um, data set, they have a series of variables that outline um, whether, you know, that position the parties that they support also on the left-right scale um, on, on, on a number of variables uh, relevant to studies of, of, uh, of, um, of the orientation of political parties. That will be fascinating when, when that, that is available. I think there are two quick questions on, on Zoom. I'm just going to hand over to my colleague. Yeah, so we have two questions. First, Sean Michel, you have a question? Hi, hi good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Eva, for really a super stimulating and quite impressive presentation. Really look forward to reading more uh, from this because it's really a fantastic contribution that is coming. Two quick comments or questions. 
will will you be able at some point to control possibly for effects of voting modality? You know, some of us have been wondering if there's an effect of a specific modality on. Uh, so is that something that you intend to look in, or that you've already something to say about? And and the second question, a bit more broader, and I don't know if we have the time to really go into this, but what would be really the um, the theoretical or conceptual contribution that you expect to to feed into this is, is are you intending to to go in towards uh, uh, political remittances or probably knowing the direction you're taking probably more towards uh, more like maybe more voting behavior but like political science and trying to continue what you've been doing to really <laughs> raise awareness about the relevance of this topic within political science and, and, and electoral studies in particular. So that these are my two quick questions and thanks again for the great presentation. Thanks so much, Michelle. Is there a second uh, question or we might take the, the two together so that... Um, perfect. Uh, so Nina, can I ask you uh, if you want to ask your quick question? Thank you. Hello, my name is Nina Klinch and it's wonderful to listen to you, Eva and Rainer and um, <clears throat> my question is about uh, actually um, <clears throat> about Turkey. Like, so um, it's it's quite interesting, and I, I wonder if you also look at if these political inclinations and electoral vote is grassroots or through the government's recognition of the diaspora, for example, in Germany, and because in the case of AK Party, as you know, since two thousand fourteen. Until that point, the political parties in Turkey actually did not really recognize the diaspora in Germany. So it was actually kind of, you know, it was a tactic which was always, it, it wasn't always legal either. They sent their buses and, you know, they opened electorates and so on and it wasn't fair. So um, I also got to know, maybe it's also useful to mention, uh, Thomas Feist had uh, some Post, uh, postdoc several PhD several years ago in a trio conference that I attended and it was exactly on this topic so do you add that like do you have an analysis that if these are like grassroots or is it like through the government's recognition of the diasporas because that could be interesting to 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 look at just also mention obviously they are targeting non-german citizens for instance because if they are German citizens, most of the time they don't have dual citizenship because of the laws, and they just have denizen, denizenship status in Turkey, which doesn't allow them to vote anyway. So, thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Nina. Can I hand back to you, Eva, please? Yeah, um, thank you for these questions. Um, I'm not sure I can do proper justice to all of them because I think you're over time for your coffee break, uh, those of you who are in the room, but just really quickly. So Jean-Michel, thank you so much for your comments. I mean, obviously you were uh, one of the fathers of the field, you could say, in terms of immigrant voting rights. Um, and we have been uh, reading and rereading your work several times over, also in the process of setting up this, this data set. So yes, we can say something about modality, um, but of course these are only national level elections. Uh, so there are different types of elections and those are not so difficult to, to code. In terms of, um, of uh, other types of modalities, like how you vote, right? If it's by mail or by other things. Um, we, we looked at this, uh, Irina and, and I, a couple of years ago. Um, and this is something that we might consider going back to. Our first goal, however, was to say something. Um, so this is, I mean, we have a lot of observations. And I think what this allows us to do is to say something broader around the, the more global dynamics in terms of of political distance in terms of the difference in the vote. Um, and I think it's important to emphasize that aggregate data has its limitations, okay? It's, it's just the vote. But at the same time, the vote is not nothing. I mean, we, we know that in terms of the literature on migration and democracy, we have these studies of um, the impact, for instance, on fin of financial remittances, on voting behavior of remittance receivers. And there is this idea of sort of a shadow of social remittances following these remittances, right? So that there is a difference whether you receive money from um, family residing in a democratic versus a non-democratic countries. But I think um, while this is a great and super inspiring literature, the aggregate, an aggregate data set like this can make a contribution as well because this is the actual vote, right? So one thing is how much money you send and what conversations you might have, but this is the voice of the immigrant in the homeland election and it says something. 
um, in terms of what's going on in migration, also in terms of the destination effect. So I think there is a methodological contribution to make uh, in terms of um, how different types of measuring this sort of micro survey data versus um, country of origin based research and then the aggregate um, data set on immigrant voting that we're setting up. None of them can do everything, but I think it's nice that this might be able to contribute to the discussion. And um, the broader theoretical contribution would be around us. Um, so it speaks to processes of political socialization, of self-selection, but it also speaks to, um, to, yeah, to this broader literature on, on migration and democracy. And of course, um, like yourself, we would definitely be trying to speak to an audience, not just of migration scholars, but also um, scholars working on these concepts in other fields um, so that we break a little bit the ghetto-ish idea of a small circle of people being interested in this, but showing that this is such an interesting phenomenon that it speaks to, to these broader processes. Now, um, very briefly, the case of Turkey is, is fascinating. Um, so what we can do with this data set is again, limited on this. We can see what there is in terms of the vote, but I think um, importantly, sometimes a broader um, large end mapping exercise also allow us then to select cases where it might be interesting to go back in and look more in depth at the different processes behind this dynamic. Um, so with this data set, we cannot speak to the very interesting phenomenon that you, I mean, we can speculate, right? But other people have fortunately also researched Turkey more of recent in terms of how maybe processes of negative political socialization combined with strong party outreach might produce particular dynamics in terms of the immigrant vote. I'm sorry, this did not do justice to these really interesting questions, but um, I'm not happy to continue. Even thank you so much. Thank you very much, for, especially for your fabulous presentation this morning. It was really wonderful to learn so much more about your, uh, your project. And as you say, the wonderful synergies that there exist between the two. So we're looking forward to uh, a great deal more fruitful communication between the, uh, between the two projects. Um, and thank you very much. And I hope that you will also be able to remain with us for the rest of the, uh, for the, rest of the morning. So I hope you'll be able to hear the round of applause from the room. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm now going to make a little bit of an executive decision and say that maybe we push the program by five minutes. Uh, Tudi, you're up next. I hope it's okay with you that we start at half past so that people have a little bit of time to, uh, to have their, their coffee break. And the same for everybody who's joining us online this morning as, as well. So thank you very much um, and uh, see everybody after the coffee break.
We give it just two more minutes for everybody to be back in the room if that's okay. Okay, colleagues, I'm going to get us started. Thank you all so much for uh, rejoining us and a particular uh, word of welcome again to um, our participants that are joining us online. We are now going to move to some in-person presentations. Um, so I'm very pleased uh, to um, welcome Sebastian Umpires to the uh, podium. Just a, a little note on Sebastian. He is uh, actually a research associate on the Global CITA Observatory project, which Reiner was mentioning uh, th this morning. So there are many interconnections uh, between uh, all of these projects and, and all, of our, uh, all of our speakers. And uh, I have in my notes here to tell you that he is a dual PhD candidate in political science uh, in Diego Portales University in Chile and in the humanities at uh, Leiden University but I also happen to know that he submitted his thesis last week uh, so he's very much close uh, to the the very end of that process so a particular word of congratulations to you um, and we are absolutely delighted to have you here with us uh, today and the title of uh, Sebastian's presentation is Emigration and Global Autocratization Exploring Non-Resident Citizens Electoral Preferences for anti-establishment politics, and this is a joint authored paper as well with Arne uh, Wackenhut uh, from the University of Gothenburg. So the floor is yours and we're delighted to have you, Sebastian. Well, hello everyone. Thank you for having me here. Uh, it's an honor to uh, travel to Helsinki and uh, to present in person uh, this very, very, very... Um, oh, I'm going to change my presentation, sorry. Yeah, that's right. So sorry for... Oh my God, I need translation. <laughs> Age? Yeah. Oh, that is good. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for the shortcut. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Teresa, for this great uh, introduction. And thank you, all the organizers and uh, the members of um, Mobileu uh, for this kind of invitation. I'm going to present 
a very, very uh, early draft, uh, co-authored with Arne Wackenhut from the University of uh, Gothenburg. Uh, so this is another attempt to connect uh, two different, maybe two different uh, literatures, uh, one more associated with uh, yeah, mainstream political science and all they're associated with migration studies. So, um, yeah, without further ado, uh, I'm going to present this uh, Emigration and Global Autocratization. Uh, just a caveat, uh, to the best of my, of my knowledge, uh, this presentation complement uh, very well. I think the, the last point of uh, Eva, because uh, we, well, I connect, uh, Border turnout, no resident citizens border turnout with uh, B party and global party survey. So maybe uh, I'm not going to waste a, a lot of time in uh, the theoretical framework, but uh, going directly to the empirical component. Um, so just to refresh your memory or to make more attractive uh, this uh, presentation. I have four uh, cases mentioned already, two of them mentioned already by Eva. Uh, the first one is Romania, the Alliance of Unions of Romanian, uh, that, uh, well, uh, no residents Romanians uh, vote more for this party that domestically speaking. Uh, at this stage, you already know what happens with Turks, for instance, in Germany or in the Netherlands or in Denmark with uh, the, uh, the incumbent party, AKP. Uh, they are also, also a, a potential or a strategic vote in, the, in that way. Uh, also, maybe you are familiar because you are very near uh, with Estonians, Ekre. Uh, Ekre uh, got well, no residents, Estonians, uh, vote as a first vote preference, uh, Ecre, and then uh, in, the, in the, the, the country or in inland uh, Estonia was in the third preference. So uh, this is also, uh, yeah, this is also nice to keep in mind. And also the Fides uh, uh, Orban uh, story is really uh, influential in terms of uh, how the accidental, accidental uh, diaspora plays a role in uh, yeah, the incumbent uh, victory or the incumbent uh, electoral success. Uh, just a caveat, uh, this is conditioned by a number of factors. Uh, such as border alignment and political resocialization, as Eva already talked about, but also incumbency presence, uh, Beth Wellman and party strategic entry, um, for instance, when electoral systems are flexible enough to uh, just compete in some districts and in other not. So, uh, keeping this on mind, uh, and of course, uh, keeping that uh, in mind that uh, autocratization is getting viral according to varieties of democracy, uh, we create uh, cross-sectional time series. And that said, in 20 to 24 countries so far in Latin America and in Southern European countries. And we combine these uh, aggregate results, aggregate uh, border turnout, uh, with uh, B party and global party survey, as I already indicate. So, what we did, what we we did in this paper, is that uh, we first uh, take the aggregate data set, only the origin countries, and then we disaggregate this or unpack these uh, elections, these uh, 380 uh, elections, in. Uh, Per country of residence, so we have a uh, large uh, uh, analysis also, uh, and then we deeper we dive deeper into diverse case studies, so we can illustrate maybe mechanisms or maybe like some uh, interesting uh, data to corroborate our argument. <laughs> 
So I'm going to present uh, three uh, different uh, plots, very descriptive, uh, to mention or to highlight and that, well, uh, we have uh, here uh, the, the most voted preference domestically, and we have here the most uh, voted preference abroad. And technically, it's not really different. Of course, you have, uh, you have a little bit more pluralistic views abroad than domestically, but it's, it's really like not significantly speaking. But you have also extreme poles. So, of course, uh, this can be an insight to, to corroborate what Turku and Urbach already said, like uh, no resident citizens are more cosmopolitan, are more liberal progressive, are more uh, green leaning, but in some cases uh, they are, uh, they, they both totally different. Of course, uh, one, uh, one, one explanation is uh, they are agents of democratization, they are agents of change, but uh, more broadly, uh, or more specifically, sorry, uh, we have uh, cases that uh, are very unique as Fides, as a Romanian, as a Romanian scenario, or as uh, Cave Verde and Turiki. So, uh, just, to, just to highlight some cases, some elections, we have Argentina and Brazil, that and they have uh, different uh, different electoral preferences between these two arenas of competition. Argentina has more anti-pluralist, uh, uh, yeah, anti-pluralist views than uh, domestically than abroad, and Brazil vice versa. But in the most uh, interesting case for me. Uh, is Venezuela. Venezuela is, uh, of course, if you know a little bit of Venezuela, you know the divide between Chavistas and anti-Chavistas. Like uh, Venezuelans abroad vote 92% against the Chavismo, and uh, Venezuela's, Venezuela inside, of course, uh, maintain the regime. Uh, we have a similar outcome in terms of populism. Uh, we have almost, almost uh, a si very similar situation abroad and uh, domestically. Uh, but more interesting for this uh, presentation, we combine anti-pluralist uh, index of uh, B party with uh, populist and some uh, indicators of varieties of democracy to create the subtype of authoritarian populism. And we have also to highlight some cases as, of course, Venezuela, but Dominican Republic, for instance. And we know uh, if you are uh, expert in uh, Latin American politics, we, we know that uh, Dominican Republic uh, well, no resident uh, Dominicans can do a difference in terms of uh, aggregate overall result uh, because um, they 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 are a size, uh, they are like a large uh, community. Okay, uh, now I'm going to uh, speak a little bit of uh, regressions. Uh, to have a broad picture or uh, a snapshot of what was uh, happening here. Um, and yeah, we can corroborate, of course, uh, the, the conclusions of Ur Ur Turku and Urbach, but also Dashkova and, 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 and Eva, for instance, uh, in terms of uh, democratic norms or um, like pluralism, anti-pluralism, and as well as uh, authoritarian populism. Domestically, our uh, voters tend to vote more to, for anti-pluralist or uh, authoritarian populism uh, than uh, no residents, uh, citizens voters. Uh, we don't find any um, 
any significant results in terms of populism, uh, which is a little strange because knowing the two regions, uh, the South and Southern European cases and also Latin America, they are pretty influential. But it seems that uh, they are both either populism, very populism, uh, very populist, sorry, or not really populist. Uh, we have also border alignment and incumbency, so we maybe have a hunch uh, here when, when uh, no residents, citizens uh, vote more for uh, anti-pluralist or uh, authoritarian populism, uh, they have a disconnection with uh, the incumbents, the incumbent party or the incumbent candidate and uh, of course uh, there is like a natural uh, disagreement between these two arenas of competition. Uh, as I already told, uh, we, we also navigate into some cases to highlight a little points. Um, we have Venezuela here, uh, less autocratic than, dom than domestically. Uh, um, on the other side of the poll, we have Brazil and Dominican Republic. Brazil for anti-pluralist index and uh, or dependent variable, and Dominican Republic for authoritarian populism. We have also influential or typical cases as uh, Ecuador and Italy. Um, so I'm going to just offer you some insights, more regressions. <laughs> Uh, and we combine uh, this, uh, this data that we have about no residents, uh, citizens, voter turnout with um, B party and global party survey with uh, some indicators or some in independent variables of uh, political resocialization. And we discover that liberal democracy is not really influential, maybe because uh, anti-pluralist uh, dependent variable is a little endogenous uh, to uh, liberal democracy. But uh, we have two interesting uh, variables uh, to the best of my knowledge. One is uh, party ideology in um, in the, the country of origin, in the country of residence. So if uh, the 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 whole the whole and the whole party system is more left, is more liberal, or if more uh, right is more conservative, uh, it bars uh, whether uh, no residents voter vote more to uh, anti-pluralism or not. Uh, the same is uh, when. When, for instance, uh, a country has a very institutionalized uh, populism as a thin center ideology uh, in the party system, um, we have the same four regressions with authoritarian populism. Uh, and yeah, it's, there are similar results uh, because also we combine. Uh, these two uh, depend variables, uh, and uh, yeah, I think uh, populist uh, predominance is uh, the most uh, interesting value or the interesting uh, yeah uh, explanation here. And the difference between Italy, for instance, and the other countries in Latin America, maybe is the uh, the degrees that Europe has as compared to Latin America in terms of democratic resilience. Uh, so uh, we are very looking forward to your comments and your uh, recommendation to better unpack these uh, maybe confusing results or uh, maybe not really explained results uh, here. And so our takeaways First is to refine or to uh, work more in the theoretical connections between autocratization, uh, party identity, and no resident citizens vote a choice uh, because right now autocratization uh, is more about uh, 
yeah, fake news on, uh, about uh, crisis of representation, about uh, public disaffection. So many voters are just uh, tend to distance from mainstream parties. So uh, this can be a link uh, here, but well, we don't unpack well um, this uh, type of theoretical appraisal that uh, populism uh, literature has. Uh, and then we have more operational issues to consider, uh, missing observations, and also, for instance, as, uh, well, three of the, 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 the cases mentioned as influential are in Eastern Europe, so maybe we can uh, increase uh, the number of observations to have a more well cross country variation and uh, yeah I think and this is this is all for all yeah thank you very much <laughs> Perfect. So, we'll throw the floor open to uh, questions both from in the room uh, and also from uh, online. Um, so, I don't know if there, if there are no questions online at the moment, we might uh, start with uh, the room. Oh, please, Marco, uh, we'll just wait two seconds for the, uh, for the microphone uh, and we'll get, uh, get started. Yes, thank you for your presentation. I have uh, two quick questions. The first one is about uh, the findings on uh, party systems. If you can better explain what are the main findings, uh, because it was not uh, straightforward to me. And whether I I you, you, maybe you could um, uh, consider also to include the party system institutionalization, which could better explain the difference between uh, uh, democracies, or all democracies, and uh, non-democracies or authoritarian regimes. And then the other one is about what extent we can compare really uh, Latin American countries to Southern European countries because we have uh, um, different legacies, different political systems, for example, presidential systems with uh, uh, parliamentary systems. So maybe you can also disaggregate the, the findings and uh, to see whether your uh, um, results uh, um, are different comparing the two distinct regions. Perfect. Thank you for your interesting questions. Uh, the first one, well, um, we only take uh, secondary data, so uh, already uh, data created by varieties of democracy, and uh, the big project of uh, Pippa Norris, uh, Global Party Survey. So we combine our uh, yeah, no resident citizens, voter turnout, and we have like access conditions, and we have uh, eligibility conditions and modality conditions with uh, some, yeah, some indicators, uh, uh, particularly um, two index, anti-pluralism index and populism index uh, from B party. So uh, this, uh, very sophisticated index uh, help us to uh, just measure uh, party identity as a thin, for instance, as a thin center ideology that needs to uh, combine with a more mainstream or host uh, ideology according to the ideational approach of populism. Uh, so we combine authoritarian populism uh, uh, yeah, as a subtype of uh, populism in, in this uh, in ideational approach. And yes, it's a, a really good idea to combine theater with uh, party institu institutionalization uh, because we have a lot of variation, uh, for instance, in Latin America. Uh, because, uh, for instance, Chile or Uruguay or Colombia can be more uh, similar to perhaps Portugal or perhaps Spain with a very uh, institutionalized uh, party system that suffered recently some multi, uh, well, some emergent parties and so on. 
uh, but we have the Andean countries that are more related to what happens in Italy or in Greece that we have like a very extreme multipartidism. So yeah, I think, uh, yeah, the second question is related, of course. Uh, why we compare these two regions? Uh, well, first, uh, from the migration studies perspective, uh, Latin America and Europe uh, has the most uh, extensive uh, migrant enfranchisement. So this is, this is good for our study. But for political science, uh, for comparative politics, uh, well, they tend to, maybe in the 80s or in the 90s, they tend to be very similar. Uh, like new democracies. Uh, Portugal was a new democracy, Spain was a new democracy. Uh, agree, uh, you know, like agree uh, treaty between uh, the political elite and the local elite, uh, we have the same in Latin America with some degree of Brian. Uh So yes, I think uh, for that reason we choose very strategically to, to just compare this region, but we are uh, thinking in expand uh, this uh, sample to other countries as, for instance, uh, Eastern European or post-communist uh, uh, Europe or, or so, to have more cross-country variation. I don't know if with, with this I respond. Can I add? Ah, sorry, excuse me, can I ask if there are other questions? I think this is really interesting work and it actually picks up directly on a point that Ava made to us about the ways in which the migration experience conditions the voters and, and how we need to just unpack this so much more to, to understand the dynamics of what is happening. Um, I don't, is there anything online? No. Um, and if I don't see any burning questions. Uh, uh, Sebastian is going to be with us for the rest of the day. Um, so if you think of anything, any questions for him or actually any advice in terms of developing this paper, um, I think it would be very much appreciated uh, either at the, the coffee break uh, or, or over lunchtime. Sebastian, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, now, without further ado, I'm actually going to hand over to Tudi, who I was uh, delaying earlier uh, for the coffee break, but who in fact was uh, due to come up at, uh, at 12 o'clock. I just um, want to begin by uh, giving a little short introduction, if that's okay with uh, everybody. Um, Tudi, Tudi Kernelegan is uh, Director of the Britannia Cultural Diversité uh, in Brittany in France and a research associate at the University Catholique de Louvain. Um, his research interests focus notably on nationalism, regional politics, emigration politics and political uh, political parties and he has edited many books but actually I think we're going to hear particularly about some work you've done with Emily van, van Houten and at this point in the day we're also now moving a little bit more to talk about political parties as actors in their uh, in this particular space um, so um, we're very much looking forward uh, to hearing more about that and seeing how it connects into our research agenda as well as the very wide-ranging one that was set out for us this morning by Reiner. Excellent. Is it, do you know where yours is? Uh, before yeah. I hand over? Perfect. Yeah. This one? This is one, yeah. Smashing. And I'm going to let you navigate the finish. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure, but this button works. I as guess. Well. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. So, yeah, indeed, I'm going to present a general presentation of a uh, research project I carry out with uh, Emily van Oud from um, Universi Université Libre de Bruxelles, which um, ended up with one book, one edited book and uh, three special issues. So with this uh, project, which started in 2017, we had plenty of uh, material uh, so cases on uh, political parties abroad. So. I'm trying to synthesize all this in, I, I guess I've got uh, 15, 20 minutes? Okay, so thank you. So, as has been said already, immigrants have been given increasingly political rights uh, in their country of origin with voting rights, which has been 
uh, talked about, but also representative institutions sometimes, or um, such as uh, Assemblée des Français de l'étranger, or some countries such as Italy, uh, Spain, or Portugal have systems to represent directly immigrants, but also some countries, some 12 or to, to 16 countries, have direct representatives of uh, immigrants in their national parliaments. So all this um, has created um, a system for immigrants to be uh, represented and therefore to be politically active. And all this has created what we called a new arena for party politics. With the, uh, the, we, we saw that whereas in, within uh, countries, political parties are in a crisis with less activists, less uh, dynamics, or more complicated uh, um, dynamics, in, among immigrants, political parties for the last 10 to 15 years have been more and more active. So the literature on political transnationalism has solid foundations to understand ex unexplained citizenship and political engagement of immigrants. But when we started the project, we had the in in impression that this literature was insufficiently focused on political parties, was a meso level of um, politics abroad. And likewise, on the other hand, because Emily is really coming from the literature on party politics, we had the we, we, we could see that the literature on party politics and on political parties completely neglected political parties abroad, apart from a few footnotes, but uh, never, uh, never more, due to uh, an issue of methodolo methodological nationalism on the study of political parties. Problem which is also seen on the difficulty of this literature to focus on sub-state or supra-state European, for example, uh, levels. So my presentation here is going to try to answer to four questions. First, what are parties abroad? Second, when and why do they emerge and develop? Three, how do they organize? And four, what roles uh, do they play? So first, what are parties abroad? So after reading all the case, case studies, uh, in the conference we organized in, uh, in Louvain or in the special issues uh, we edited, we came up with a very simple uh, typology with, based on two dimensions. First, where is the headquarter of the political party abroad, whether in the home country or outside the home country, and then uh, how is the relation with the parties abroad with the home country? Is it peaceful or is it conflictual? So we distinguished, uh, distinguished diaspora politics, which, uh, which is the continuation abroad of a political struggle uh, that is rooted at, at home, and immigrant politics, which is a more de democratic, peaceful participation in the politics of their home country. And we ended up with four groups of uh, parties abroad. So the, mo the most widespread are immigrant party branches, such as for the US, Democrats abroad, for France, the branches of uh, La République en marche abroad, or Labour International, or, uh, and so on. There is also in immigrant politics a small group uh, of very specific parties focusing only on immigrants uh, with their bases abroad, which are, because I come from uh, regional politics, a kind of regionalist party specific to immigrants. There are not that many cases, but for France, for example, there is the uh, Alliance Solidaire des Français de l'étranger, which has two senators, for example, or for Italy, there is a Movimento Associativo Italiani all'estero, which is quite active in Southern America, for example, in, in Brazil, Argentina, and so on, and which has also um, uh, representatives in the Italian uh, parliament. In diaspora politics, we can distinguish between two types of parties. There are diaspora or anti-diaspora parties, with um, either authoritarian uh, countries, parties trying to control the diaspora abroad, so there are 
plenty of examples such as AKP in, in Turkey or um, countries, uh, uh, parties trying to continue abroad a struggle that they don't, uh, uh, they don't carry out sufficiently at home. And there is also another, uh, so the last type of parties are forbidden parties, parties which, which cannot exist in their own countries, so they continue abroad as a struggle. So it can be uh, Tibetan parties, for example, or the Spanish Communist Party during the Franco dictatorship. So now let's move to the second question about when and why parties abroad. Here the aim is to understand when do parties abroad exist, when do they start, and um, why, and which, which, which constraints. So we try to uh, understand the main uh, opportunities or constraints in the creation of parties abroad. So there is first a constraint linked to the host country. Some, par some countries uh, may be more reticent to, um, to accept uh, party activities, foreign party activities uh, on their land. For example, for a very long time, Canada was quite, was quite uh, hostile to uh, party activities in, on the territory of Canada. And for example, it created problems in 2012 when French um, voted for the first time for uh, MPs for French abroad, Canada was not, uh, didn't want to accept that uh, electoral um, activities took place on the Canadian uh, territory, which uh, now they, at the end they accepted, uh, of course. There are also constraints linked to the home country. For, so for authoritarian countries, of course, there is a problem of, of the level of control of, a state, of, the, of a, the state apparatus. But there is also, and this has been explained by the first three presentations, the issue of uh, voting rights and ballot access. Um, there is also the, the, the constraint of party-centered or candidate-centered electoral system because a uh, candidate-centered electoral system which will be more difficult for parties to, to, to get involved abroad. For example, Japan or um, South Korea are very candidate-centered electoral system where candidates are their own party in, in practice. So Japanese or Korean parties are very uh, little uh, present abroad among, among immigrants. Another opportunity is the existence of specific representation for, for immigrants, which is quite a rare case, but developing, for example, for France, Italy, um, Croatia, uh, Portugal, and so on, Tunisia, Algeria, and Ecuador also, which, of course, when there is this specific representation, uh, parties have a strong motivation to organize abroad to, to gain those uh, senators or those MPs directly representing uh, um, immigrants in the national parliament. On uh, concerning uh, institutional constraint, there is the issue also of the level of rep restriction of campaign rules. For example, as far as funding is concerned, all countries uh, or most countries have rules which can be quite problem problematic uh, abroad um, just to stay in the limits of, of, the, of the rules. For example, in 2012, two uh, French MPs were elected, uh, and, but, but then uh, the, when they controlled the election, they saw that for their election they opened, opened a bank account uh, abroad in their country of residence, which is completely forbidden. So they lost their seat uh, and they had no will to, to go beyond the law, but it was so complicated to have a bank account in France to, to have a campaign abroad. That's, well. So this can be a, a restriction also. Another constraint or opportunity can be ethnic and identity. With the stronger uh, the ethnic identity, the more the, uh, uh, a party may well to be present among the diaspora. And this is not only for uh, national identity, this can be also subnational. 
For example, for uh, Taiwan, Taiwanese uh, parties, Ta Taiwan uh, has no, uh, uh, Taiwanese abroad cannot vote for national election, yet uh, Taiwanese, Taiwanese parties are very present among the diaspora because they continue abroad a struggle ab at home between the two main parties, one representing the, uh, the Kuomintang, representing the new Taiwanese who uh, emigrated in Taiwan in the 20th century, and the other representing more uh, those who want to get uh, outside uh, China and who are based uh, on ta Taiwan for, for, for a very long time. So this, this struggle of parties abroad is more to control also the, the, the diaspora. Uh, finally, as far as external stimuli are, are concerned, there is also the issue of the, oops, the issue of the structure of immigrant population with issues of size, density, and stru social structure, with the idea that the more the um, immigrants are scattered uh, in the world, the more difficult it is for parties to be present among immigrants. The more they are concentrated in a few cities, um, the more it's easy for, for, for parties to be, to be present. Um, because, of course, um, for example, for France, uh, the world has been uh, divided in 11 constituencies because they can, uh, French abroad, uh, vote for uh, have 11 MPs in the French Assembly. But there is one constituency which is constituted of uh, all of Asia, all of uh, Oceania, plus Russia, Ukraine, and so on. So mostly half of the world constitute a single constituency. So of course it's very difficult for parties to be present in such a huge constituency. But uh, on the other side, even in such a huge constituency, French are mostly present in a few cit uh, cities, in Hong Kong, in um, in Australia and so on. And if you go to Hong Kong, to Singapore, to Australia, you see uh, most of the French parties have, um, have groups and, and quite active groups. So the cost of investing abroad can be high for parties, especially if immigrants are scattered. Uh, also more that the particip particip participation rate is usually low, yet increasingly parties do engage abroad. So the development, development of immigrant branches abroad is on, often closely linked to that of external citizenship and voting abroad. For example, you can see that for France, there were two waves of creation of parties abroad. First, at the beginning of the 80s, when, the, um, when was implemented a reform for the election of uh, the Assembly for French Abroad, which represents in Paris all French abroad, and from uh, when Mitterrand arrived to power, this assembly of French abroad, uh, he decided that it would be directly elected by French abroad before they were nominated uh, directly by uh, the minister, uh, minister of uh, Foreign Affairs. So since he, um, he decided that there would be an election, parties, but mostly the Socialist Party and the right-wing uh, conservative RPR at the time, organized abroad. Then there was another wave of, of organization of parties abroad after uh, Sarkozy's reform to implement the election of uh, MPs um, for, for, for French living abroad. So uh, at the beginning, very beginning of, two, uh, of uh, the 2010 uh, decade. And now, uh, after 15 years of implementation of this law, all parties are organized abroad and are rather active. So favorable, favorable legislation does not always precede the development of parties abroad. There, there is the example of uh, Taiwan or, or Israel, for example. And uh, the process of setting up a, a party branch abroad uh, tend to be bottom up and relies on immigrants organized in a community. But we've, uh, we've seen that uh, quite rapidly party branches institutionalize and the mother party takes back control of the structures and activities developed abroad. Third question, how do parties abroad organize? So we've seen that uh, as I said, the creation of parties abroad are usually uh, bottom-up, 
But they tend to replicate the organizational structure of the mother party with local groups, formal or informal, and often a federation of party branches abroad, which is not always the case. For example, for Lib Dems abroad, they created three federations of, uh, party, um, branch, of, of branches abroad, one for um, Europe, one from, for the uh, rest of the world, and one for France, uh, Lib Dems in France. I don't know why, but it's, uh, it's, uh, so they've got three federations. And parties abroad uh, face a higher dispersion of their grassroots on the territory of the host country, which makes the organization of regular parties' activities more complex, but still, uh, and this is important, such regular party activities are uh, present through, throughout the, the year, but yet in comparison to um, home uh, political uh, politics, uh, party politics, there is this importance of online tool to compensate. So now let's move to the last que question. What role for political, political parties abroad? Why uh, do they exist? What do they do uh, in rea reality? So first, as all parties, um, political parties abroad exist to simplify and structure electoral choices. So at home, parties have increasingly turned towards their governmental functions. But parties abroad are skewed towards the relation with immigrants uh, to the, to the de detriment of their functions as organizations or in go government. Parties abroad tend to engage in social cultural activities, uh, such as uh, drinks, such as debates, and so on, but they can also provide help and services to immigrants. Parties abroad also create linkages with immigrants, socialize and integrate them into the political system, into their own uh, political system, which is rather important for second generation uh, immigrants, but also uh, generate identification and loyalty, loyalty towards the home and us country. For example, when I did the research on uh, the activists in British parties abroad, and half of them, when answered why they joined uh, a British party while living in New York or in uh, Hong Kong, half of them answered to show my uh, commitment for my own country. So there is this uh, banal nationalism which is very important in this commitment of activists in parties abroad. But parties abroad are torn between acting as advocate of the par party's current program and the representation of lo local interest. As local representatives of migrants, they aggregate the interests of immigrants, they provide policy positions and services, they lobby even the mother party at home to integrate topics that are important to their constituents, such as tax issues, such as education or language schools uh, abroad, or, or issue about, um, about retirement and so on. But parties abroad also act as ambassadors of the mother party abroad among immigrants. Finally, the parties abroad do perform the classic functions of party. They simplify and structure electoral choices. They serve as channels of communication. They educate citizens. They participate in their socialization and integration in the political system. And they have also programmatic, uh, programmatic function. So in comparison with parties at home, parties abroad are more uh, focused on socialization and integration, and much less uh, present in uh, government um, politics, except in the very few countries where, uh, where um, immigrants have direct representatives in the, in the parliament. So to conclude, political parties abroad are as old as political parties because we have already instances of political parties abroad in the 19th century. But they are now, or for, for the 15 
last year in the process of quick development. The main reason for this is the development and generalization of voting from abroad and uh, in a more li limited number of cases of immigrant representation. But parties abroad also exist without voting rights for migrants. So despite important constraints, constraints Parties abroad have been able to carry out most of the functions of parties at home. And all this, just to conclude, is really transforming the territorial, territoriality of democracy and citizenship where political life is not only within the frontiers, within the territorial frontiers of the nation, of the nation state, but also as a level of the world uh, integrating all the nationals even living outside these frontiers. So thank you for your attention. Yeah, sure. That, sure. Right? That, that was really fascinating. I mean, you never really think about it, but you have party finance rules which effectively make campaigning abroad impossible while having uh, laws coming through to encourage political parties to engage with citizens uh, abroad and it's like one side of our democracies don't talk to the other side of our democracies. It's just fascinating to see it presented in that, uh, uh, in that way. Um, can I hand over to the, the room at this point? Uh, maybe we start online now, please. Yeah. Uh, Rainer, please. Uh, uh, thank you. This is absolutely fascinating. Uh, I have a specific question about the case that you mentioned uh, of a host country, Canada, trying to restrict the activities uh, uh, of parties in, in carrying out election campaigns uh, in its territory. I was just wondering whether you know more cases like this. I imagine there is, first of all, a difference between uh, uh, a rejection of uh, specific, the target specific parties that are seen to promote, for example, an authoritarian agenda inside a democratic host country. That would be the case of many Western European governments objecting to electoral uh, campaigning by the AKP uh, in, in, in Turkish elections. Uh, but the case of Canada is a more general one where a democratic country objects to uh, a party from uh, another democratic country uh, carrying out uh, electoral campaigning in its territory because it sees this somehow as conflicting with uh, its uh, uh, sovereignty and jurisdictional claims uh, and uh, maybe creating dual uh, loyalties among dual citizens. So I was wondering whether you find more cases of the latter, of a kind of general objection, and I expect, of course, that uh, there would be general bans of uh, party activities abroad in autocratic governments, but inside democratic host government uh, regimes. Uh, is the Canadian case unique, or are there other cases like this? And is it probably also connected to voting methods? So I imagine if uh, the main voting method for voting in home country elections is postal ballots, or maybe even electronic ballots, like in the case of Estonia, then that will raise fewer objections among the host country that is somehow hostile to these activities of parties abroad compared to uh, voting methods that entail uh, embassy voting or voting at specially designed polling stations in its territory because the territorial component of the electoral campaign becomes then much stronger. So I'm just asking for more and more cases uh, on that particular question. Thanks. Yes, thank you for, for this question. You're, you're right, the, the first instance of uh, situations where countries for diplomatic reasons may not be willing that uh, forbidden uh, parties in another country have, uh, can, can have their activities normally in their country. This is quite widespread. Uh, the issue of Canada in, in 2012 uh, is unique as far as I'm, I know, and even Canada, they changed their rules. Now they are accepting um, political activities in their territory, because in 2012, 
there was this unique uh, problem with Canada because even in China, for example, uh, even in Shanghai, Beijing, the French parties can have their activities as they want with no problem whatsoever. So, no, Canada was only the single example I, I have. And even Canada, they changed. Thanks so much. Thank you, Reiner. Um, can I ask if there are any uh, other questions or further for the comments or advice within the, the room? Marco, please. Ah, just one second and, and we'll get a, a microphone just so that everybody can hear online as well. Okay, thank you for your interesting presentation. I would like to know if you, in your research you have also some findings about the level of activities of these parties, I mean abroad. If they, are, uh, if they, they organize regular activities just for elections or if they are just uh, formal, there are formal organizations but they are not very much uh, engaged with mobilization uh, in a daily base, on a daily base. And uh, another question is about the links between uh, these uh, structures and the other, um, let's say, external organizations, like, for example, trade unions or associations of uh, immigrants, for example, abroad. I mean, if they connect to other uh, non-party organizations and to what extent, for example, left-wing parties can privilege some linkages with the uh, uh, trade unions abroad uh, at the European level, for example, um, or other types of organizations? Well, the level of activities depends a lot. Of course, during election periods, it's much more important, and it depends a lot uh, whether there is a huge diaspora or not. So, for example, in New York, all French, British, Spanish parties are active all year long because there is a, a huge diaspora in other parts, even of the United States, for example. Uh, apart from election periods, groups uh, almost disappear or have a Facebook page, but uh, that's all. So it depends on, on, the, yes, on territory and on, on temporality also. Concerning your uh, second question, uh, yes, parties abroad do have contacts uh, with uh, associations, trade unions abroad also, which, are, which can be um, good or, or bad. For example, f French abroad are mostly represented by two big worldwide associations, Union des Français d'Étranger, which historically is right-wing, and uh, Français du Monde, which historically is left-wing. And uh, left-wing parties are very connected uh, to Français du Monde, and right-wing parties are historically very connected to Union des Français de l'étranger. So m during, during the year, to answer also your first question, many party activities are already, uh, are in reality, uh, d done through the lens of the associations or not of the party, because it's easier to be more widespread, to attract new people uh, through the asso association, which is um, political, but not uh, partisan. And yes, uh, concerning also contacts, they have contacts with association. And uh, parties abroad, I, I didn't mention it, they also have contacts with the, the, the similar party in the country, for example, uh, the the French Socialist Party in, in Portugal will be linked to, to, their, to their equivalent in, in Portugal and so on, and this happens quite a lot. So it's even um, quite good for parties who, who can be rep represented, represented in the conferences of the, um, of, uh, the sister or brother parties through uh, the diaspora. So someone doesn't need to fly from uh, Paris to, um, to, to Lisbon for a, a conference, but uh, the, the representative of the French Socialist Party can take the floor, for example, during the uh, conference. So. Perfect, thank you very much. Ah, one last question, so please. It was Mark, all right, so I think I'm gonna follow up on that because um, it's, it's quite interesting to me that you use the term political parties abroad because that was very confusing for me as you know, uh, this takes me back to the very theory of everything and it was like Big Bang for me because then it's like, 
sometimes diaspora comes first and then it's a nation state and not all transnational communities are diasporas and not all diasporas are political, you know, and not all diasporas are homogenous either. So from the case I know, it was interesting to me to think about Turkey. If you look at the German example, um, you know, there is one diaspora, but there are so many sub-diasporas. But it, I wouldn't use the term political parties abroad because then, for example, uh, there are the AK Party supporters, but AK Party ha hasn't been really just targeting Turkish or, you know, mildly Islamic or something. Like, it could be also like the Kurdish guest workers at the time, but then there was the HDP or B BDP. And again, I wouldn't use the term PKK because it was banned already in 1993 and also in EU Court of Justice in 2008 and 2018. So, uh, and, and, and then there's the CHB. And so you really see that the, um, I think the mic. Okay, so you, you, you really see this like very heterogeneous like diasporic communities and the parties are also targeting like very different people and associations are of course working with those but not necessarily to also affect something in the homeland you see, you see what i mean I, to me it's it's that um, this general picture is sometimes too general to understand the specifics of each diaspora and like the political process and the political party abroad term I don't, I'm really curious how you conceptualize this, if, if you wrote it, uh, or if there is a terminology for that. Or should it be said that political diaspora activities and associations in relation to political parties in nation states or something? So, yeah. <laughs> Well, in the book we edited, there is a very interesting chapter on uh, Turkish parties in Germany, for example, so you, you can read it. I'm not a specialist of uh, Turkey. We use the concept of political parties abroad in a very, very generic way to include all party activities outside the frontier of uh, the nation state, so all activities of AKP or uh, HDP and so on outside the frontiers of Turkey could be included uh, in, uh, in this broad uh, church of uh, parties abroad. Of course, afterwards, we did a typology to explain that um, branches of parties abroad are different from for forbidden party, uh, parties like uh, PKK. So afterwards, uh, when implementing uh, specific research, you, you need to refine, of course, uh, the, the concept and use more specific uh, concepts to, to uh, talk about a specific reality, of course. So I don't know if I answered correctly your, your question. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's a very challenging question and challenging <laughs> note on which to, uh, uh, which to draw this particular presentation to a close. Unless I see any last burning questions, Tudi will be here, of course, for the rest of the day. Um, so uh, he, he will be available if you have any questions or, or comments as well later on. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Tudi. That thank was absolutely a fascinating presentation. <laughs>
Roundabout, which is going to be uh, hosting us in the afternoon. And then my colleague, uh, uh, Carlos Pamis, is from, uh, he's actually joining us on behalf of the research team at the University of uh, Liège, uh, and he is a PhD candidate in political science at the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, and he was previously a visiting fellow in the Centre d'Etudes Européennes of Sciences Po in, uh, in Paris, um, and his PhD dissertation lies at the intersection between candidate selection and political <coughs> representation in multi-level contexts. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to my two colleagues. I believe uh, Stefan is going to go first, so I'll let you um, get the presentation uh, up. I'm also, while I'm here at the podium, going to ask you to fill in the sign-in sheet. I'm not entirely sure what the, um, the disposition is for European Commission funded events now in this hybrid era. We have, of course, a, a photo of the online participants, but we will continue with the usual uh, form of signing the sign-in sheet as well, just to uh, prove that we were actually all here, uh, all here today. So I'll pass that along and I'll hand over to, to Stefan in the first instance, please. Thank you. Okay, that should be the correct presentation. So, uh, as uh, Teresa said, we are sort of presenting a short summary of, 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 of some of the ongoing activities within the, within the Mobile EU project next. And, and I will be talking about what we call Work Package 3, where we are working uh, on, on, on the survey data that we are, we are collecting within this project. And, uh, the target of, of Work Project 3 was to have like a vignette survey to examine citizens' awareness and views of electoral entitlements of mobile EU citizens. And, and that, that's straight from the, from the research plan. And, and, and the objectives are, 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 are following uh, this uh, directly. It's, it's to evaluate the awareness and views of, of, gener of the general population as well as of, of mobile EU citizens. Uh, especially then on, on voting entitlements and, and uh, of, of, the, of the mobile EU citizens. Uh, so what we are doing in practice here is, is, is actually to conduct several different surveys. So uh, we have already conducted a, a survey experiment using vignettes uh, and that was conducted among resident citizens. Uh, but we're also uh, in the process of, 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 of planning and, and, and designing two additional uh, surveys. One, one that will be conducted among resident citizens and one that will be conducted among non-resident non citizens. Uh, and the target populations here are, 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 are citizens uh, from the project's five uh, uh, target uh, countries that are included in the project. So, so if you remember, uh, Osa's presentation from earlier, that's Finland, Belgium, Ireland, uh, Poland, and Portugal. And, and, and as I already said, we have already conducted the first, the first uh, data collection and, and the, the, the rest will follow in, in the fall. Uh, I, will, I will talk really shortly about the, the sort of more traditional surveys first. So, so these are, these are, the first one is conducted, uh, or they are conducted simultaneously, but the one of them is conducted among resident citizens, as I mentioned. And what we're interested in, in, in here is our attitudes toward external voting and immigrant voting. We're also interested in, in immigrant voting. Uh, and we also will include some knowledge items on, uh, specifically on external voting, because we want to know how much they actually know about the ex external voting and, and, and about the immigrant voting as well. And we will look at also, we're also interested in, 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 in the modality of voting, what they think about that, and some more general political attitudes. And of course, we will need to have some background information on, on all these respondents. And, and the recruitment here, we will probably use a, 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 a web survey and, and, and a, a panel from, from Qualtrics most likely, that's what we used already for the, for the survey experiment. It turned out that they could provide the sort of most representative data that we, we can get for, for, for a panel. We, we tried with different companies, but it's, it's not easy to get 
uh, representative data from, from these panels uh, for, for, for multiple countries. But this was the best that we could get. And what we will target is around like a thousand respondents for, for each country. And, and we will try to make have, have the same survey, that's the targets, have the same survey for each country, so we have like high comparability. Of course, uh, when we want to survey non-resident citizens, we run into to, to some issues. So of course, they can't be recruited in the same way as, as resident citizens. There aren't, there aren't ready-made panels uh, that, that with, with non-resident citizens there. And we, there, there's, it's very difficult outside of maybe Finland, Sweden, to even get a, a, like a, a random sample or a sample of, of, the, uh, of the population, uh, of, of the non-resident non population. So, so we, uh, we have to rely on, 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 on other types of, of methods to, to recruit them, the respondents. And our strategy, and this is a strategy that has been mostly used in, in, in almost all other cases, is that use some sort of, of a convenience sample. Uh, what, what, what others have used and what we will, prob what we will do as well is, is basically contract, contact potential respondents through uh, fa Facebook groups for, for citizens living abroad, a mailing list that we, might, uh, that we get at least through some of the emigrant uh, associations, and then sm snowballing from that. That's, uh, that's basically how, how we have to do it. There are some pros to this. We can potentially get a large, reach a large number of, 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 res, uh, of respondents, but there are, of course, many drawbacks to it as well. So we're going to have problems with self-selection. It's not going to be very representative. Uh, we, we might get multiple, multiple responses from the same person and not knowing that that, 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 that is the case. Uh, and and we, we, we can't even know if there are actually are the non-resident citizens who are responding. Anyone might respond in their places, even, since we will distribute links to these different, these different sites and, and, and mailing lists. But this is still basically the only way to, to, to reach them. So those are sort of two more traditional services that we that will uh, follow this fall. So uh, what we have done so far is, is 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 conduct a survey experiment using vignettes, and and vignette studies they are basically sh where you use short descriptions of a situation and or, or a person, and uh, to sort of elicit judgment uh, of of these scenarios that are described in the in the vignette, and this be, can be quite useful when you when we discuss things that a lot of people may be quite unfamiliar with, such as external voting and external voting rights, and, and the potential problems linked to this, because it's, it might be difficult to, uh, to understand what that means. And of course, a benefit of survey experiments are that they combine, like the, or are expected to combine the, the, the representativity of a, a survey, at least a survey that, that, <laughs> where you have a representative sample, uh, and, 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 and of course, the the causal inference to, uh, that you can make from, a, from an experiment. That's something I already said. So what we decided to do was, was to design an experiment with a 2 by 2 by 2 factorial design. We had around 125 to 130 respondents for each cell, and roughly 80% of them, a bit depending on since we did this in all countries, uh, passed an attention check that we, that we also used. And, and we, we already had some problems when we recruited the, 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 the respondents in the sense that these are not as, the data isn't as representative in all, in all cases. And, and what I'm sort of the first data or analysis I will present here is, is, is with un unweighted, unweighted data. But what we were interested in here, the three variables that we had in our, uh, in our design is, is basically focusing on, on, a, on a few big questions uh, or things that we already have discussed uh, during the day here. So, so we, we have like this sort of uh, policy learning uh, argument or information that we gave to them about, about the sort of growth or improvements uh, to enfranchisement of, of, of external citizens. So we, you, you will see the description in, in a few seconds. But uh, just telling them about that this is something that's possible in many countries, basically. And then, then we had one argument revolving around all affected principle or all affected interest, uh, interest principle, uh, meaning that, that 
but only those who are affected by a, by a decision should be able to, to, to influence that decision. And lastly, we had one that we were sort of connected to the, this stakeholder claim that, 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 that Reiner uh, described earlier. So do they have like a genuine connection to the, to the home country or country of origin? And, and first we just gave them a general setting. We described the setting and that, that was basically that. And, and here's his for the Irish one because that's one in English. Uh, but, but that was the same for, for all, all countries, obviously. They, they were given a description of, 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 of like potential changes to the legislation on, on electoral rights uh, for, for parliamentary elections. And, 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 and then they were given different arguments and, and then they had like got a combination of, 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 of these arguments. So the first one uh, focusing on, 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 the, on the policy learning, so there was like basically some policy learning or just like a more neutral one and, and there are equivalents for, for, for the two next ones. So one, one sort of emphasizing the two, be emphasizing the, the fact that they shouldn't have the right to, to participate uh, since, since, they, since it has limited impact on their lives. And, and the one uh, and, and three B uh, that they are not sort of fully engaged. They don't have a, a genuine con connection to, to the home country anymore, and therefore they shouldn't have the right to participate in, 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 in national elections. And, and here are just some, some preliminary findings for 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 the direct effects. We have uh, this, this becomes quickly quite complicated when we have uh, five five countries and and, and, and and try to look at this, but. Uh, these, are, these are some of the direct effects of, of, of what we find for these variables and, and the outcome variable that I don't present here is, is whether it's a good or a bad idea that, that, that uh, external citizens are allowed to vote in, 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 in parliamentary elections in, in, in that particular country. And, and, and what we find is that the, the policy learning argument doesn't really seem to have, people don't react to that at all, whereas, whereas uh, in the cases of Finland and Portugal, the ones that have the uh, the sort of most elect, where they have the most electoral rights, uh, the, the all affected uh, principle argument may, may, had, had, an, uh, had sort of had mm -hmm. made a difference. Uh, where, whereas the and, and the stakeholder claim actually made a difference in all cases except for Ireland. So these are these are just some some really. Preliminary findings. We will look more into then sort of combinations of 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 of, of, of these of these arguments as well later on. That's all for me. Um, so good morning everyone. Um, I'm going to talk uh, for a few minutes now on our uh, work package uh, for, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, on the electoral um, legislation data set and also um, our work on, on a compilation of uh, diplomatic uh, missions. As uh, Theresa said, I'm presenting on behalf of the uh, Liege team, which is in charge of, of this working package. Um, consisting of um, Jean-Michel Lafleur and, and Daniela Bintila, who are joining us uh, virtually. And of course, um, thank you all for, for, uh, to, to the organizer for making this possible. So very briefly, um, the, the objectives of, of this working package is to collect data on the voting rights of mobile EU citizens. Um, this is for national, um, subnational, that is uh, local municipal elections and supranational EP elections um, held in um, EU countries of nationality and, and residence. We will refer to, to these citizens as uh, non national residents and non resident nationals. Um, this working um, package for data set includes. Um, um, different types of, of information from the type of, of the elections in which um, the EU citizens are entitled to vote um, to the legal requirements, um, the voting modalities, and, and other information on the, on the diplomatic missions and, and, and electoral authorities. Um, 
this working package is, is um, it, it will be used in, in various ways, um, so as to academic research, but also um, in a comparative uh, report that we are um, um, writing on the best practices and policy recommendations, uh, um, and, and, and also for the work package uh, five that uh, Theresa is going to uh, present in, in a minute. Um, and, and, and we believe that uh, this part of, of the project is, is, is important to understand uh, the different um, voting rights in your countries, which, as ASA has highlighted, are quite diverse. Uh, we have um, uh, countries with uh, wide electoral rights, um, but, but, but all, like Portugal, but also we have um, countries in which these electoral rights are narrower or are, uh, they're, they're just not no electoral rights at all. Um, um, and to do this, we rely on, on several data sources. We use the uh, websites, and, and we also have been um, consultating the national electoral authorities, but we are also relying on, on existing um, information from other projects, such as Global Seed, Space U, Fair U, and, and so on. Um, so the data set um, can be, um, or actually consists of, five different parts. We have the, 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 the main ID variables, um, such as the type of election and the uh, date of the election. We also have uh, information on the requirements to become entitled to vote. Um, and, and then we have um, the part on voting modalities, so whether um, someone can vote in person or uh, remotely, um, information on the electoral district, um, and, and then the, the, uh, the part on the legislation and electoral bodies, and finally, uh, the information on the um, diplomatic missions. Um, I'm going to show some of the uh, findings. Uh, of course, these are preliminary finding, findings, even if uh, this is a finished version of, of the data set. Um, but we're welcome, welcoming any comment you, you may have on this. So looking at this graph, which is on the voting rights of um, all U.S. citizens across, actually, EU 26 um, uh, countries, because I guess you cannot have a, um, a consulate in your own country, right? But um, looking to the uh, right side in each of the, of the levels, that is EP elections, national elections, and, and local elections, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, due to the EU legislation and electoral rights associated with EU citizenship status. Mobile EU citizens uh, have the right to vote in EP and, and local elections uh, that are held in their uh, countries of residence, but they cannot vote on the national elections uh, held in these countries. The, the situation is um, much more complicated um, when it comes to uh, their right to vote in, in their countries of, of nationality which would be on the left side, that's non-resident nationals. Um, and in general, uh, we can see that um, mobile US citizen, citizens are allowed to vote uh, from abroad in EP and national elections that are held in the countries of uh, nationality. Of course, there are some, some exceptions, uh, namely Cyprus, Malta, and Ireland, for instance, in, in Cyprus. Um, only uh, some, uh, certain civil servants and, and their spouses uh, can vote in Ireland only diplomats and their spouses, and in Malta it's, it's only possible, uh, possible to vote for um, public servants and member of, of the of the discipline forces and so on. Um, in um, in the case of, of mobile US citizens um, in local elections for uh, when they are trying to vote in their countries of nationality, um, most of them um, remain disenfranchised. Um, actually, only a few member states uh, exceptionally allow, uh, allow to uh, the non-resident citizens to, to vote in local elections, and, and generally this entails um, rather a strict um, eligibility uh, criteria. This is the case of Latvia, where only non-resident um, non citizens are allowed to vote in uh, local elections if they hold a property in the municipality, for instance, or in Italy where non-residents uh, can vote as long as they return to Italy to, to cast uh, the ballot, and this is connected in a way to, to the voting modalities, which I will um, talk about in the, in the next slide and the second table. Uh, but uh, we also um, here are showcasing some of the information we have on the 
um, out uh, on the registration. Uh, we are showing here in the first table the percentage of cases in which there's uh, automatic uh, registration, which is uh, generally uncommon, um, except for non-national uh, residents at, at the local level. This means that um, in most cases, EU citizens, mobile EU citizens, must personally um, submit a voter registration to, to be able to cast a ballot, and this is, of course, more time-consuming, and this may very well have an effect, a negative effect on the turnout uh, levels, uh, for instance, in, in uh, the not so newly implemented um, backed vote system in Spain in which uh, you actually get the authorization when, uh, once the election is over. Um, as you can see, um, automatic registration is, is, is very limited for non-resident nationals at, at the local level, but around a quarter of the EU countries do allow their non-resident nationals to be automatically uh, registered uh, to vote for EP and, and national elections. Um, as for non-resident uh, nationals, um, actually only one, uh, one or two uh, member states, Lithuania and, uh, and Hungary, if you have a, a, permanent, a permanent address, uh, you are automat automatically uh, registered to vote for EP elections. But yeah, th th there's a, um, a few member states, uh, actually almost half of the member states uh, proceed with an automatic uh, electoral registration for non-national res residents in local elections. Um, as far as the voting modalities is concerned, um, generally non-national non residents can choose uh, between the same voting uh, modalities uh, compared to um, the, uh, the, uh, the other group. Um, however, the voting modalities uh, for non-resident nationals are, are generally more restricted. Postal voting is the most common uh, way to uh, uh, perform non-in-person voting. Um, and, and, and this is available in half of the EU member state for AP elections. And, and, and electronic voting, which is, a, of course, a, a less time-consuming um, modality for non-residents, uh, remains, um, however, an, an exception besides um, Estonia. Um, but but th there is at least four member states, which are Poland, France, Belgium, and the Netherlands, in which non-residents can also, uh, for instance, assign a proxy to vote for elections such as EP elections and, and local elections. Um, finally, moving to some of the data we have on, on the diplomatic uh, missions. Um, I, I'm sorry I forgot to turn this uh, figure into color at some point, but I wanted to highlight. Can you see the, cur the mouse? Yeah. I uh, just wanted to highlight some of the um, uh, countries that um, uh, we are focusing on, which are, if I can move it, uh, Finland, which is on the um, higher end. Uh, we also have Belgium and Poland, which are above the mean in terms of their consular presence in other member states. And then we have on the lower end Portugal, and then farther uh, in the lower end um, Ireland. As, as you can see, in France, Finland, Hungary, and Germany are among the EU countries with stronger uh, consular presence you know, across the EU. Some small countries actually have a, a rather strong diplomatic presence with up to 60 to 20, uh, 80 sorry, um, consulates. Um, I'm referring to Malta or Luxembourg. And, and actually, they do have more consulates than Spain, for instance, of course, Spain has a large network in, in other places in, in Latin America, right? But um, meanwhile, um, in countries such as uh, Bulgaria, Cyprus, and, and Ireland, uh, they, they, they count with less than 30 uh, consular, mi uh, consular missions. It's also, in a way, striking the case of Ireland, given the size of the diaspora, but maybe in the same uh, logic as, as Spain, the consular presence in Ireland may be greater in other countries, such as Anglo-Saxon countries, um, which are not covered, of course, uh, in here. And finally, just wanted to um, um, show you the distribution of the consular networks uh, of the five countries that we, uh, as I said, analyze in, in, our, in our project. Um, and, and we are referring here to the places in which uh, these countries uh, have uh, the largest number of, of consulates. Um, 
as, and as you can see, um, the five uh, countries that we have uh, that we have analyzed are generally concentrated in the, the, the consular networking countries where most of the diaspora is, is living. For instance, this is the case of uh, um, the Swedish consulates in, in Finland and the uh, Portuguese consulates in, in France. Um, some countries appear to uh, spread out or, yeah, in a way, evenly distribute um, their consulate network more than others. There's the Irish Irish case on the on the other side, um, in in which one third of the consulates are are in Spain, whereas in Belgium, uh, Finland, and and Poland, not a single destination country has more than 15 uh, percent of their consulates in in the EU. Um, France, Spain, and to uh, uh, to a less extent, Italy are the main destination countries for, for these um, consular networks, and and these are also the countries that. Um, gather the, the, the larger amount of uh, uh, diplomatic missions uh, for other countries uh, other than, than these five. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, just to, to wrap up, we have included this, um, this information in, in our uh, data set, this information on the consular network, because um, we believe that uh, consulates uh, usually, usually offer information to citizens abroad about their electoral rights as well, and, and in many cases even um, uh, citizens can can vote uh, in elections abroad uh, that have been held in in diplomatic missions. So, uh, we hope that this is uh, useful uh, also to the part that Teresa is going to explain now. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Carlos. I have just a two slides to present uh, to you because I'm essentially the salesperson for the project. I'm responsible for communication and, uh, and dissemination. But I might begin with what I suspect is an insight into why 33% of our consular offices are in Spain. I don't know for sure, of course, but I suspect this is where many Irish holidaymakers lose their passports, and uh, this is why we need to have a large consular network uh, and a large consular network there. But I don't know. Um, the uh, purpose of, of Work Package 5, which is led by uh, University College Cork, is essentially to uh, communicate the findings of the research and the uh, work that we have been doing as part of this project. Um, the kind of central plank of that communication will really connect directly to the strands that have been outlined by both Carlos and, and Staffan. In the first instance, uh, the data that has been collected by Staffan is being designed into an interactive tool which will be available on our project website um, which will be uh, searchable by citizens uh, from where they are residing uh, and from uh, of course their original country of citizenship so they will be able to search what their individual voting rights actually are at the various different uh, elections uh, and also of course how they can exercise those voting rights so the the digital tool is is currently under design and, and we will be launching it in in September it will go live over the summer months but we will be launching it in in September uh, at a forthcoming uh, conference the the website is also going to share the data that we have been collecting as part of the, uh, the, the uh, work packages uh, that Staffan has been outlining. So the three surveys, the questionnaires, uh, the actual, uh, well, the, the cleaned data, uh, which is uh, data compatible and compliant, will all be posted on there and will be downloadable for other researchers to work on uh, in due course as we move to the end of the uh, project. And we also hope to have some data visualization options so that people will be able to see easily um, what the kind of headline findings from the research project uh, will be. So that's a, the kind of a central plank of the communication of our findings. And of course, we will be using uh, our events uh, and our communication channels to uh, highlight these and to communicate them uh, to the academic community, but um, most especially in the case of the digital uh, platform uh, to voters whom we want to, uh, of course, come and use uh, this particular tool uh, so that they can um, exercise their voting rights. Uh, the other kind of fairly um, basic elements of our, our packages just to, to be aware of is that we of course have a Twitter feed which is particularly active today. If anybody would like to uh, follow us it's on the, uh, the our uh, Twitter handle is on the, the program. We also have a, a Facebook page and 
Um, in the kind of second part of, of this year, we're going to be developing some of the, the other aspects um, where we'll be communicating our research in, in more digestible formats. So we have some blogs planned and, and uh, maybe uh, some podcasts as well by the end of the year. Then the second part, of course, is the dissemination strategy, and, and this is more directly con connected to the academic uh, audience. Uh, so we will uh, we have had two project seminars. This is our second one um, uh, from the project. We will have a policy workshop in Brussels, which is very much connected to Work Package 4 um, and the uh, voting rights and the data set. So we will be sharing uh, both the digital tool and its functionality, but also more detailed findings and policy recommendations recommendations arising from all of the work that the University of Liège um, has been carrying out. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, the final uh, project conference will share uh, more developed findings from across the entire uh, project and also, of course, communicate uh, what we've done um, uh, as well. We have some conference papers and publications and uh, this is effectively um, kind of wrapping up the dissemination to the academic uh, audiences. And this is what we are leading out on in, uh, in, in the uh, University College Cork. So, I know that I stand between you and your lunch, uh, but I will throw the floor open if anybody wants to ask any specific questions, possibly not about our Twitter activity. I suspect it might be more about the very interesting data collection uh, that we have been doing. But if anybody has any questions for Stefan and Carla's, um, I might throw the floor open uh, at this particular point. Is there anybody that wants to, to ask anything? And of course, also to our online participants. There's anybody? Ah. Uh, two questions. Maybe in the room first, if that's okay, please. Yes, this is in a way a, a comment also um, in addition to what was raised in, the, uh, uh, in relation to the earlier presentation, which has to do with context sensitivity. When we talk about best practices in this field, I wonder uh, my experience comes from minority studies in different contexts and we've noticed that the best practice uh, concept is not a very good one because it varies so much in different situations. Think about Ukraine today and the violent uh, uh, policies of a neighboring country against this country or Latvia which is always under pressure of the same type, or some countries who are under pressure from Turkey. Uh, practices there can be very different from practices in other places. So we've changed to use rather successful practices, uh, which is context sensitive, or uh, useful practices, which is also context sensitive. I wonder uh, how do you consider this kind of terminological pickiness, if you may? Huh. I, I might hand over to, to Carlos. You, you're, can I just clarify, you're getting at kind of de jure and de facto, is it? What, what is in law and what is in, in practice? Huh? Uh, I'm actually uh, talking about exactly how generally you uh, recommend practices as being best or as being more context uh, driven and v with a greater variance. And what signal this means in, uh, in, in relation to uh, how you consider context in the work that you do. Do you want to take it or uh, hand it to Carlos maybe? Um. Um. I think I got it right. Um, yeah, I, I guess the concept, the, 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 sorry, the context is, is, is rather important. It's, it's not the same to have a large diaspora that is just spread out um, around the globe. It's, it's not the same to have um, a, a large diaspora, but, but, but just in, in one country. And, and this is what we are also trying to, to, to see what, what, what kind of, um, N not maybe the fact, but what, what kind of uh, distribution of, of different ways to, to enact and, and, and proceed in, in um, uh, regarding electoral procedures, um, hopefully um, thinking that uh, some of these um, characteristics have a, um, an actual effect on the way in which um, um, non-resident citizens and non-citizen residents engage uh, 
in 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 politics. So that this is part of what we are trying or we are trying to do. But but of course the context is is, is rather rather important. We are we are focusing here on 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 things such as the voting rights that I have just. Um, uh, presented, but there are other ways that I have not uh, discussed. It's also really important to to think in terms of of, of how um, of, for how long do you have um, the the ability to vote, whether you have to uh, renew with um, doing certain uh, things or not. So th these are rather complicated uh, questions, but we're trying uh, to to address some of these in in our in our working package in this case. Yeah. Online? Just a moment, we have an online question. Oh, Reiner, please. Yeah, uh, hello. So, uh, just to understand whether your project also aims at uh, uh, coming up with policy recommendations. For European institutions, you know, there have been previous projects like Fair EU and others that you mentioned that already did to some extent the inventory of the obstacles and uh, facilitators of um, uh, electoral participation by mobile EU citizens. But, uh, you know, from my participation in these, I always felt um, uh, some unease with the kind of policy recommendations that we could make in the end. Uh, so you can always suggest to remove remaining obstacles, but we also know that doing so will not achieve the other main goal, which is to raise turnout very significantly. One thing that can be done to raise turnout, and I was just wondering whether you're trying to uh, promote this, is uh, specific campaigns, uh, especially around local elections, maybe also around EP elections, that would have to involve civil society, NGOs, uh, and not just setting up uh, websites, you know, where, where citizens find the information and can uh, then through the interactive tool that you're trying to build, know what they have to do. They have to be motivated uh, to participate. And this is where we academics come to our limits and what we can do. Uh, my second comment is that what we have found out also among surveys in Austria, for example, is that uh, EU, mobile EU citizens often say that yeah, more participation in local elections and EP elections are not their main goal. They really feel excluded from national elections uh, in their host country. And there, of course, uh, the only way they can get access to this is through uh, naturalization. Uh, which uh, throws up the question whether the main obstacle for <laughs> political participation in the host country is not the nationality laws of the member states that uh, the EU has no competence to change. But I think it needs to be pointed out again and again that this is the main problem uh, compared to uh, the other things uh, that the EU can already do at the local NEP election level which are rather limited as long as this main elephant in the room is not addressed, that the EU has no competence to harmonize nationality laws. Thank you, Reiner. I might hand over to Carla's in the first instance to address the point about the, the policy recommendations. I think we completely agree with your, your position, but uh, Carla's, I'll give you, give you the floor. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think I can only agree on that. We are, we are actually... Um, uh, taking a look at the, at, at the best way to approach uh, this policy recommendation, but but I I, I recognize it's it's hard to to make such type of statements on 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 e even on on how to develop best practices, right? It's it's not always um, um, easy, and and it's actually really interesting what what you say in in the way in which um, turnout or, or participation can be um, increased and and enhanced. It so. We will, we will consider all this when, when writing our uh, policy report, for sure. Uh, okay, um, I'll probably just make one other comment um, in relation uh, to your, your point, um, uh, Reiner, and it's a pretty inadequate one, which is that we're building a stakeholder network as well, and, and that's what our September workshop is, is about, and it has kind of two functions. In, in a way, it's the critical um, infrastructure for the project to reach the emigrants um, 
uh, in, in the surveys because we, we need to be able to, in some countries it's quite easy to identify the immigrants living abroad, but in many other countries not so much, so we need these critical gatekeepers um, for that work. But they are also going to be a really valuable asset to the project in terms of disseminating uh, the, the tool, which is it's inadequate, but it's, it's broadly what we are, we are doing, and we hope in some way that it will at least uh, be available for the future local elections and European elections, um, and that the stakeholder network can at least uh, advise voters where to go to be able to access that, that information. Um, so it, it is a little, a little something. Um, at this point, I'm going to draw the, the morning's uh, proceedings to a close. I really only have one duty left, and that is to issue really sincere thanks uh, to Society of Swedish Literature in, in Finland for your most gracious hosting of us, uh, of us here today. Um, it, it's all the more important for our project because this is our first in-person meeting, and to meet in such beautiful surroundings uh, with such wonderful colleagues has been a great pleasure. Um, so if you don't mind, I'd like to offer a round of applause to our, to our hosts uh, and all our participants today. Thank you. And we'll see you all at 20 past two. Is that okay? Half past two. Half past two. 2.30, perfect. And the, the same link will work for the afternoon for anybody who's online. So see, see you all then. Thank you.
Okay, so it's, it's, it's time for this, the second part of, of today's seminar. Uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is, is, is Staffan Himmerus and I'm uh, the PEI of, of, of a research project on uh, Swedish-speaking Finns living, living abroad or non-resident Swedish-speaking Finns. And that's what we're focus, focusing on here this afternoon. So it will be a, a focus on a very particular group instead of, of, of uh, discussing, discussing these issues of, of, of the electoral rights of, of non-resident citizens more generally. Now we will be focusing on a, on a, on a particular group. And <clears throat> this is a group that at least an international audience might not be very familiar with. I don't know how much the, the ones here learned during lunch. <laughs> But, but, of course, this is something that, that you might need some background on, and, and that's also what we're going to pro provide here, or OSA is going to provi provide with a, with a short presentation after, after, after this, this a few welcome words. And, but after that, I will talk a bit about the project in, in general, uh, uh, what we set out to do and what we have been doing, and, and, and then we'll move into sort of more uh, specific... Uh, both uh, methodolo methodological issues and, and, and specific sort of research topics that we have been, been looking into in, 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 during this project. So I think without further ado, Osa will tell us a few words about Swedish-speaking Finns and, and, and their political behavior, so you have some idea what we might expect from, from the Swedish-speaking Finns abroad. Okay, uh, thank you Stefan for allowing me to speak about this topic. Um, this will be a very brief introduction just to the Swedish speaking minority in Finland, extremely short, just to 
as Stefan said, give you some context to as to the group that we are actually focusing on in this project, because it's an an interesting group, I would say. Mainly here, we will just give you some background uh, on who the, the specific features of the Swedish speaking population in Finland, and then some about their political behavior of this group of people, since we are studying political behavior within the project. Uh, so Swedish as a language in Finland. Uh, Finland is officially a bilingual country, and there are two national languages, Finnish and Swedish. Uh, so in, in, the, uh, in terms of the official status, these languages has the same, same status, so to speak, at the national level. But only 5.2% of the population is registered as Swedish speakers. And that's around 290,000 people. Uh, and so there is an official register, or a person is registered either as a Finnish speaker or as a Swedish speaker. There is no possibility to, to be bilingual in the official registers. Uh, and in practice, many people are, of course, bilingual and speak both fluently, both Swedish and Finnish. But 5.2% of the population is registered as Swedish speakers. Uh, the population which is Swedish speaking is, is not equally distributed across the country, but you can see on the map, the yellow sections there is, is uh, where most Swedish speakers live. So the majority of Swedish speakers live in the southern parts and the, in the western parts of the country. So we have here in Helsinki a fairly large group and then towards uh, around the southern southern coast of Finland, to Turku, as you might know, and then there is the Åland Islands out in the waters. This is not a very good good quality of the of the map, I'm sorry for that. And then a bit uh, on the west coast there is, is the city called Vasa, and there is a group of a uh, large population of Swedish speakers. And in Finland there are 309 municipalities, and of these 33 are officially bilingual, and now I can see that there is some, I, mean, I hope I'm correct in the number, but I have, we have specialists in the room, so it's always dangerous to, to state this, but I think it's 33 um, bilingual municipalities. And this is relevant because it has to do with, with rights in terms of language uh, um, provisions and, and so on. So it's, we have the national level regulations, but we also have local level regulation in terms of which language you can use in, and in which kind of situations. So that's the basic stuff. 5%, they are not equally distributed across the country. Uh, in terms of political behavior, the Swedish speaking minority is also a kind of peculiar group of people. And that's relevant, of course, to know and to learn to understand what we are talking about in, in the next of the, presenta the presentations later this afternoon. Uh, the most relevant traits, I've tried to list them. Uh, let's see, if we've, but I think I got most of them here. So the Swedish speaking population has at least historically been more politically active than the Finnish speakers. Uh, so we can see this, uh, although that we do not register turnout, we cannot track turnout according to language, because that's not how the statistics is produced, the official statistics, but, but we have other means to learn and other ways of, of kind to dig into this and, and try to figure out. And the general, general picture of this is that the Swedish speakers are more active from various data sources. Uh, and this goes to turnout in elections, but it also goes to other forms of political participation, which we have uh, uh, investigated via survey research. Uh, but perhaps the most important difference is that the party choice of the Swedish-speaking minority varies substantially <laughs> if we compare it to the majority. And I will show you this in a slide, on the next slide. But the Swedish-speaking minority or the Swedish-speaking population also is on average higher in social capital and there is a strong sense of community within the language group, so there's strong identity. It's also a group which scores positively in, in efficacy and support for democracy and political trust. But the most important, and my last slide will come here, and that is the distribution of 
of uh, party choice in the last uh, election. So this is from the Finnish National Election Study from 2019. And of course, these, as you know, when we do survey research, you, you probably understand that the Swedish speaking group included in the survey is not particularly large. So there is some uncertainty. But the Swedish speakers voting behavior is very stable over time. So we can say with these patterns is very well corresponds to what we know from previous surveys. So the blue uh, is the distribution of votes for or reported party choice for the Finnish speakers. And the yellow or the orange uh, staples are, are for the Swedish speakers. So you can say that there is one very high one there for the what is called SPP, and that's the Swedish People's Party in Finland. That is a party which attracts a clear majority from less than 60 to almost up to 70% of the vote votes casted by the Swedish speaking population. So that's uh, that's what you need to know in order to to understand and and contextualize what we are talking about later in this afternoon. Thank you. I don't know if there are any questions at, at this point. Uh, if there are, you're you're free to to to. to. Uh, otherwise, we will move on sort of more to the topic. This was more meant as a sort of background, but of course, if there's more information, and we can get back to this if it, if it's if it's needed later on. Okay, so I will talk a bit more about what, what we're doing in this project and, and about the Swedish-speaking population from Finland uh, living, living abroad in, in general and, and, and their behavior, and, but mostly focusing on, on, on what we're doing here in, here in this project and, and, and the data we have collected and, and how we are going about this research. So first, shortly about the project, it's, it's funded by the Society of Swedish Literature in Finland, the host here today. Uh, and and it's, uh, at, at the moment it's a five-year project. It originally was a, a four-year four project, but it was extended by one year after we got the mobile EU project. And, and since there are several people working in both projects, we simply didn't have the time to, to, to do all the work here and, 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 and the mobile EU at the same time. And, and, uh, the, the society graciously extended uh, the project by one year, and this was, and we we have we received a sum of three hundred and ninety thousand to to do this research, and and what we're doing here is is we're examining political behavior, meaning political participation and political attitudes of the Swedish-speaking Finns living abroad. And and the project members, you will meet some here today, I think. Uh, all except for one is here today, and one will be the last one will be for the dinner. <laughs> so, so we had like uh, uh, Mikael Harjola, who is a PhD candidate, Isak Vento, who used to work both here as a PhD candidate, but later when he when he finished his, his uh, dissertation, he also worked as a postdoc in the project. And Johanna Peltoniemi, who's not here today, uh, she's also was as a postdoc in the project, and then Osa was working in the project, and and now our latest addition is, is Maria Beck, who, who will be presenting later today. And, and I'm, I'm the PI of the project. So that's, that's the sort of overview of, 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 of who we are. So, but the bigger question is perhaps, that why should you care about non-resident Finland Swedes? And I think that's perhaps a, a good question. We have, we, have, we have, as also mentioned, there aren't that many Finland Swedes to begin with. And once we talk about Finland Swedes living abroad, there's even less. There's even fewer. Uh, uh, so, so why should you care? Uh, before I answer it, I, I, I think we should we could take here a, a, a sort of a look at at, at where the non-resident Finland Swedes live, and and as you can see, most of them reside in Sweden. So, as a large majority, so it's almost 75 percent of, of of the eligible voters among the non-resident Finland Swedes live live in Sweden. 
Uh, and, and for most countries, it's, it's just a few hundred or so. There are a few countries where, where there's around a thousand or so. There's Great Britain. And of course, uh, I'm very sorry because this map, the, the, everything here is in Sweden, uh, Swedish. It's just taken from a report. But here's a, a chance for you to lear learn some country names in Swedish. There will be uh, a couple of more slides where there will be some few words in Swedish. So, but I guess that most of you can guess what we're uh, guessing the, the names of the countries. But there are a few countries where there's a, few, a little more. There's Great Britain with a thousand. There's Norway with more than a thousand. There's also in the U.S. more than a thousand. But we're very, very small numbers in 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 in, in comparison with with countries that have really large diasporas and and, and millions of, of migrants. But I think we, there's still things we can learn from 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 this group. And, and I should also mention, even though they are very small numbers in each country, they actually exist in, I would think, around 110 countries based on our data. So they are really spread out, even though they aren't that many. It's only altogether, it's 32, 33,000 maybe that, that are eligible uh, voters among the Swedish speaking non residents. So, a few reasons to care. So, the first one being, we don't know very much about minority groups among non-resident citizens. Mo we mostly think about this, uh, about non-resident citizens reflecting back to the nationality where they come from. So we think about them as, as in relation to the country that they come from. So we don't really think about the minorities. So, so that's, that's, that's one reason. We, we don't actually don't know much about like subgroups of, of the non-resident citizens. So that's, an, that's an, I think, an uh, important point to make here. And, and why is that important? Well, minorities behave differently. As, as Osa just presented, minorities' sort of political behavior can be very different from, from the majority. And, and, and that, that does go beyond party choice. It, it's all kinds of political behavior can be quite different uh, compared to the majority population. And, and minorities, they also differ in their migration patterns. So again, a bit of Swedish, but I hope you can. I hope you can. Get, I, I will help you. I will help you with the difficult ones. <laughs> so, so uh, minorities. The little data that there is suggests that my, minorities are actually much more likely to to migrate than than the majority population uh, in countries, and, and this is the case here in Finland as well. So, so if you look at f Finns in general, they make up five and a half percent of, of eligible voters, the, 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 the Finns living abroad. But whereas you look at the one that, uh, the, the, the other colored <laughs> column, that's the Swedish speaking uh, 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 non-residents, and they make up 13 percent. So that's, that's quite different from, from the majority population. So whereas Finland then would be a, like a quite typical Western Europe, European country when it comes to migration, uh, the Swedish-speaking population is more uh, similar to, to, to the countries that have, have fairly large diasporas. Even though it's a, uh, we are talking a really, about really small numbers, uh, absolute numbers, the, the relative number, the relative number is, is, is quite high. So that's, that's, a, that's the second r reason to, to actually care about uh, Finland Swedes. So we care about what they represent, not so much about uh, the Finland Swedes in, in themselves. Uh, and the third good reason is data availability on Finnish citizens. So uh, since there is uh, register, in, since all, all non-resident citizens are registered in, uh, in, in Finland, uh, that, that means that we can look at, at these groups in, in, dif in different ways that it's, than is usually uh, possible. So as, as we mentioned before, when, for uh, the mobile EU project when we are collecting survey data, we have to, we have to rely on, on convenience samples to, to, to do a survey among uh, the non-resident citizens. We don't have to do that w in this project, as I will tell you. We, 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 can, we can rely on a, on, a, on, a, on a random sample because we have, we have information on, on, the, on the whole population of of, of uh, non-resident Finland Swedes. Of course, it's, there's some issues with, with the reliability when it comes to this kind of information. It's, it's not as high quality as it is for, for resident citizens, but it's still much more than, mo than there is for most countries. So that means that there are uh, sort of methodological ad advantages to, to, to studying Finland Swedes if you want to learn something about uh, non-resident citizens and their political behavior. So, uh, this whole project was designed around survey research and, and, and comparable surveys. 
And, 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 and the most important survey for us was, was the one that we conducted among, among non-resident Finland Swedes, obviously. And this we did with a dispro disproportionate stratified random sample of, of non-resident Swedish-speaking Finnish citizens, mm -hmm. uh, uh, meaning that, that we actually we, we, we chose to look at 15 countries uh, and, and we, we chose uh, uh, a portion of, of, of the of, of, of the population from each of these 15 countries. And we also, they're, they're not uh, sampled exactly in the same way. Uh, Sweden, for example, that uh, is, is undersampled a bit because it's, it's, there's so many in Sweden and, and the other cons are, countries are a, a bit oversampled. So that's, that's, that's uh, how we, how we uh, that's, that's the sort of the, where all the invitations went. Uh, and, and, and we invited them via, via mail, so we just sent, sent them an invitation via mail, and, and then they were asked to, to answer a, a web survey. And, and we were shocked by the response that we got, because we, we, we didn't know that, would we reach these people? We knew that some uh, of these addresses are old, that they are not, not very reliable. We didn't know, would they be interested in, in, in responding to a survey? But in fact, it, it, it we noticed that they were very, we quickly noticed that they were very interested in responding to this survey. So we, we, we got almost 2,000 responses and, and a response rate of 41% to, to, to this survey, which is, I would say, a good response rate to any survey in these days, but this uh, particularly high when you, when you think about uh, a sample of non-resident citizens, that you can't contact time after time after time and remind with uh, SMS and, and so forth. Uh, the survey in itself, it was a fairly lar large survey with uh, 170 items and it was at least partly based on the European Values Survey. I will explain why in, in a few seconds, but that's we used for, for sort of general items we used, we, we, we used from, from the European Values Study. But, but with a stronger focus than on, on, on issues related to, to political participation and, and, and political attitudes. And of course, we also then had, had specific questions concerning uh, that, that were relevant to non-resident citizens and, 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 and to the, to the, the Swedish-speaking minority. And this survey was conducted in, in, in the summer of, of 2019, directly after uh, the last uh, Finnish parliamentary election. So, and another central survey to, to this, to this uh, project is, is uh, a uh, European value study survey done in Finland, but only for the Swedish speaking population. And that, it was done only for the Swedish speaking population because there had previously been done, uh, one conducted for, for Finns in general, but that was only uh, done in Finnish, meaning that it was mostly just Finnish speakers replying to that. So it was only like one or two percent of the respondents were, were Swedish speakers. So it's not much that we can analyze based on that data. So there was a, a separate survey. Uh, done for the Swedish speakers. And, and this is also why we use uh, the European value survey questions in, in our questionnaire, because this was conducted also in early 2019, a few months before uh, our, our survey to the non-resident citizens. I mean, we have comparable data now with, with, that we can use. We can compare resident to non-resident citizens, and they have responded to the same, same, same uh, questions, or largely to the same questions. So, so we, 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 can sort of, we can tackle questions of, of what changes as a, as, as a result of migration, because we can directly compare the resident to the non-resident citizens. Exactly how we should do this is something that Isaac will talk more about, so whether, how we should do this in, in, in a methodological sense. But of course, that's our first important point of comparison that we had of the, between these two surveys. And, and the sort of findings that we can that we can get from these are these are just some examples from some of the research we have been doing. So, so to the left we have we have this sort of uh, party choice of, or party preference of uh, of, of the of, of the Finland Swedes, and and here is just for the ones living in Finland and Sweden. That is something we we, we looked at for, for one paper, and you can see that there's not much of a difference. This this, this seems to be fairly stable uh, uh, for, for between these two groups. So, so the Swedish People's Party, that's, that's what people favor, even if they have moved outside of Finland, or at least the, the ones that have moved to, to, to Sweden. We actually expected that, that, that the reason that we looked at this is well, we wonder whether the Swedish People's Party would be relevant to those living in Sweden, because the Swedish language is, is, 
theoretically less less like uh, relevant from a minority perspective today because they are talking the majority language when they are in in, in, in Sweden. So, anyways, but not much hap happens there, it seems, and perhaps that could also be expected. Uh, uh, party identification, party choice is something that that does not change very swift, swiftly or not much at all. But then we have other findings that are more radical, uh, like insane, I would almost <laughs> say. We had a hard time believing these findings when we first saw them. So, so this is, this is, this is a, a combined measure, but it looks like this for, for, for most of these sort of political trust measures. So, so the trust among the emigrated, the non-resident citizens in, 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 in Finnish political institutions is, is, is much, much higher than it is for those living in Finland. And, and, and <laughs> quite, quite interesting findings. And, and now you have to remember that if you think about the map that I showed you at first, where, where, where are they moving? Where are they migrating? They're migrating countries that are basically the same as Finland. So it's, it's, I would perhaps expect to see results like this if they were migrating to, to Russia, maybe, or something like that. This, this is quite interesting. And these are, these findings seem to be very robust. They are not just a bias in, 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 in the data. This is something uh, Isaac will talk more about. So it's, it's, it's quite interesting. So they, they can be very different from, from, from the resident citizens for certain attitudes. So, but we also have other surveys that we can make use of. Uh, so uh, at the same time we conducted the, the, the one on non-resident Swedish speakers, there was one on non-resident Finnish speakers, or it was uh, basically on non-resident Finnish citizens, but, with a f but the data is mostly, mostly includes Finnish speakers. So that's another point we can, we can actually compare the non-resident Swedish speakers to the non-resident uh, Finnish speakers to see, to see how, how, if they are, are, are different in, in their political behavior. And last but not least, we can actually, since we're using European values uh, study data, we can actually compare the emigrated citizens to the citizens in the country where they live. So that's, that's our whole design. We, we haven't re done all of this, <laughs> which will be clear very soon. Uh, but, but the ambition was, uh, <laughs> this was the ambition, uh, to, to be able to compare all, all these kinds of, 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 of Data points. So basically, we can compare the the, the, the non-resident citizens' data to to all kinds of other 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 surveys, and that's that was sort of the the idea. Yeah, here's here's an example from this is from the like the the, the Fini, uh, data for the Finnish speakers, but this is not compared to the to the Swedish speaker. It's only compared to resident uh, Finnish citizens. But uh, I thought this might be interesting because we are talking here about electoral rights and and. And, and here's, a, here's a, uh, from, an, from an article where we looked at what, what these different groups think about the electoral rights of, 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 of non-resident citizens. And, and, and here you can see that, that, that the non-resident citizens are much more critical of, of this statement that they should lose their electoral rights after, after 10 years. Maybe not so surprising, but there is, this is the kind of, also this kind of research that, that can be done with, with, with the data that we have collected. So, but we, after we started the project, we also, we also learned that we would be able to, to, to get some register data on, on, the, on the external voters, some voting data on the, uh, for actual voting data for, on the external voters. And, and we have used two types of, of register data in this project. The first one is just that since that's for the surveys, basically, because when we started this project, we knew nothing about uh, non-resident uh, Finland Swedes. Uh, and, and we had to learn something about them just to, to, to make a, a, a good survey. And, and then we were able to get from the uh, Digital and Population Data Service Agent in, Agency in Finland, we were able to, to get like a, a, a sort of basic population data on, on, on the Swedish speaking population. So we have like the countries that they live in, uh, gender balance and, 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 and so forth. That's, that's one type of data that we have uh, re registered data that we have, that we have used and, and that is very useful to us, especially when we, when we conducted the surveys. 
But another type of data that we have is, is voting data on the non-resident citizens from Statistics of Finland for all national elections between uh, 2011 and 2019. Um, the election data then is on, 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 on seven elections, it's on two presidential elections, it's for three parliamentary, uh, parliamentary elections and for two uh, elections to the European Parliament in, in, in 2014 and 2019. And, and we can, for example, here get data on, 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 on not only if they voted, but also on how they voted. So, so for example, like the, the modality. Uh, of voting, so whether they voted at a polling station in the country of residence, or in Finland, or via mail, and so forth. And for us, we can uh, most interestingly, for or for this project, uh, we, we can we have there's data on the national language of, of the voters, so so whether they were registered as Swedish or Finnish speakers, with some limitations, as as I will show you in a few seconds. So. Again, a bit of Swedish, I'm sorry. <laughs> but here is, here is uh, data for electoral participation for these seven elections among Swedish speaking non-resident citizens who have migrated after 1987. So uh, before that, there, there wasn't like, the, the data doesn't tell us if, it's, if they are Swedish speakers or, or, or Finnish speakers before this, unfortunately. So we can only look uh, for those who have, have sort of migrated in, in, during the last, what is it? 35 years, 30 years. Uh, so, so, but anyway, what, what we can see here is, is and, and these numbers compared to the numbers that we know for in the last election, for example, it was around 13% of all uh, non-resident Finns that, that voted. This has, uh, is perhaps, perhaps somewhat reflective, the 30% is somewhat reflective of, of the fact that it's very inclusive how, 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 how they can calculate these non-resident citizens. This is, these are much higher partly because, partly because it has not been as inclusive, but also partly because we are looking at a, at, at a, at a time period of, 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 of citizens that have uh, uh, moved, migrated in, in a later period. So they are sort of there are more citizens here who hasn't lived that long uh, in another country and they are usually more likely to vote. But what you can see is around 20, 20%, 22% 20 uh, participating in, in, in the in the Riksdagsval, which is the parliamentary elections, and that has been rising somewhat or and also quite dramatically for, for, for the latest uh, parliamentary elections, which is almost five percentage points higher. Whereas nothing has really happened for the presidential, the two presidential elections, and nothing has really happened for the two European parliamentary elections. And of course, this might not tell us very much. It's just like uh, numbers on who, who, how many have voted, but it may, becomes a bit more interesting if we can compare them to the to the Finnish speakers. So this is Finnish speakers for the same same time period, and and then we can see that that the Swedish speakers are more likely to vote in parliamentary election, or the non-resident uh, Swedish speakers are more likely to vote in, in parliamentary elections. Uh, just like uh, Osa told you, they are, they are more politically ac active. But when it comes to presidential elections, they are much less active, uh, or substantially less active, to, uh, active voters than the Finnish speakers. And, and for the EU parliament elections, yeah, it's much the same, and then there's some weirdness in the end that I don't, that I can't really explain. Uh, I, I would say that the difference here can be explained, I think, quite easily. We haven't looked into the, to, to this in, in, in any detail yet, but I think that the reason that they are more like the Swedish speakers are more likely to vote in parliamentary elections is that it's easy for them to vote uh, for a, for a, for a Swedish-speaking party or Swedish-speaking candidates, whereas in the presidential election there will be. The, the, the Swedish, uh, Swedish People's Party will not be uh, very successful and there won't be uh, also that many candidates that are Swedish speaking and I think that's at least part of the reason why we see this difference. There might be other things that, 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 that Finnish speakers value, value the presidential election for, for other reasons also, also more. And then something on the on the modality of, of voting that we also have, have 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 data on. So as you can see, the 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 
Mo most of the citizens, they vote in advance abroad. So this, and, and, and this is for two elections and it's for the, both of the language groups. So Swedish 2015 means the Swedish speakers in, for the election 2015, Finnish uh, 2015 means for the Finnish speakers in, in the 2015 elections, and, and then you have the equivalent for the 2019 elections. And the difference here is that before the 2019 elections, uh, we, we introduced le legislation on, on, on voting via mail. And, and you can see that there's, this had, had some effect, that there are people are somewhat less likely to, to vote in, in advance abroad once, once this legislation uh, was introduced, and that's especially for the Finnish speakers. Again, this is, probably has to do with the difference in, in, in migration patterns. Uh, Swedish speakers mostly live in Sweden, where there are the most sort of polling stations abroad. So it's easier to, for them to, to go and vote in advance at the polling station, whereas the Finnish speakers are, are more spread out, even though Sweden is the most popular destination for them as well. They're more spread out, so they are therefore perhaps more uh, motivated to use, use uh, the possibility to vote by mail. And, 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 and voting in advance in Finland, that's also something that's been more relevant before that, and, and has become more or before in, in the election, in, in the earlier election, and it has, it has sort of quite dramatically decreased. And it will be interesting to see how these numbers change for the next election, when people may be more aware of, of, of because this was a very new uh, legislation when, when for the last, uh, for the, in 2019, and there might be more people now that are aware and, and, and know how they are supposed to vote uh, via mail from abroad. But some, some changes already happening in, in the first election. But these are just examples, of course. We can do much more analysis-wise, but these are some examples of, of what can be analyzed with, with, with the data that we have. Lastly, I thought I would also say a few words about maybe the difference between looking at, 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 at register data and survey data for, 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 for turnout and political participation. Uh, even though we have a fairly representative sample, uh, people are of course more, much more likely to say that they have voted in, in, in the last elections than, 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 the, than the registered data shows. That's the, uh, the columns to, to the right, that's the, the last uh, Finnish parliamentary elections where 38% of, of our respondents said that they had voted. Uh, and, and this is of course much higher than the 20 something percent that we saw here and uh, of course uh, very much higher than the 13 percent or so that it was for, for all, all Finns. But uh, what we can do with this data is, is of course, we can, we can compare it to, to how they report that they have behaved in, uh, in elections in the country of residence. So we, we would expect that, that, that they would be as inclined to sort of lie about their participation in, in, in Finnish elections as they would be, or at least at a similar level as they would be in their participation in, 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 in local elections in the country of residence, which is the most popular option where 70% say that they have participated in, in, in local elections in, in, in the country of residence, and, and, and around 50% actually have said that they have, 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 have voted in, in, in parliamentary elections during the last 10 years uh, uh, in, in the country of residence. So I think that's, that's, that's quite interesting still to see that it's, they are quite active, even though they aren't voting in their country of origin elections to the same extent, they are, they are quite active in, in their country of residence uh, elections. Something that, uh, that, of course, previous research has, 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 has shown as well. Yes. And these are all pieces of, of, of research that come from, from these publications that, that, we, that we have so far produced in, 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 this, in this project. Or these are, they are from these publications, we have a few more, but, but they are from these publications, these pieces of information that I've presented so far. But now I will sort of give the word to, to, to my colleagues who will talk more in detail about, about the sort of more detailed research that we have, have been doing and, and, and the methods that we have been, have been using. So, thank you.
questions? <laughs> Mika. Okay, thank you. <coughs> um, yeah, so my name is Mika Terwan, I'm from Migration Institute of Finland, and I was also <laughs> very much uh, struck by this 41% uh, that you mentioned uh, in, in the response rate. So I was kind of uh, curious about this. Uh, I mean, um, just as a backup, we, as a background, we, we gathered a kind of a, a, a database on survey studies on uh, Finns abroad, uh, including uh, Swedish-speaking Finns uh, from 1920s onwards. And I think this is probably among the highest, if not the highest, uh, response rate. So, uh, I mean, this, that kind of leads me to two questions. So first question is, uh, what is your trick? And can you <laughs> share it with us? Um, and the second question is, uh, on a more serious level, have you, have you kind of reflected on this? I mean, how do you interpret, interpret this in itself? Uh, I mean, what does it tell about? Is it kind of a, um, I mean, um, is it about your methods? Is it kind of a, 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 a social capital issue? Or is it uh, also an issue maybe of like kind of a, a political worry about uh, migration within the, the uh, Swedish-speaking Finn community? Or, or how do you interpret this? Thanks. I have given it some thought because we, we were, as, as I said, we were very surprised by the by the response. Uh, I think it mainly has to do with the group that we are focusing on. So, uh, as you said, there has been a few studies uh, focusing on 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 non-resident Finns in general, but but no studies of of, of Swedish-speaking non-residents in particular. <laughs> And, and that's something we got from like uh, open questions was that like nobody cares about us and, and, and finally someone wants uh, are, are, have some interest in us. So I think that's, that's part of it. And then it's, then it's probably also a bit of this sort of social capital and, and it might be the fact that of course we are also Swedish speakers that, that sort of asked them, they, 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 knew, they knew about that. So, so they, that might also heighten their interest in response. And, and, and as, as we had like a comparable surveys, uh, survey among the, then like the, uh, the, the general popu population of non-resident citizens, mainly then uh, Finnish speakers, and that had like only half the response rate. So there clearly is some, some kind of difference there. Uh, I, I can't give you an absolute answer, but I, I think it's mainly that, that they feel that, they, they, that Finland has forgot about them and, and maybe also the Swedish speaking part of Finland has forgotten about that. I think that's, that's the main reason. And they still have extremely strong connections with Finland. So, so most of them live in, in Northern Europe and, 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 and Sweden. So they, they come back all the time. They have very strong connections to Finland. And still, Finland and Swedish-speaking Finland isn't interested in them. So I think that I think that's explains most of it. Uh, methodologically, I think we're doing pretty much the similar things that as, 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 as the as our Finnish and Swedish colleagues have been have have been doing doing before, so I think it's I think it's this group that that felt a bit forgotten and uh, despite having strong connections to Finland. Other questions? Okay. Isaac. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, hi. Uh, Hello everyone. Um, I'm Isaac. Uh, very nice to be here. It's been it's been really interesting to, to hear all the presentations before me. Uh, uh, I'm currently I'm a, a university lecturer at the University of Helsinki. Uh, my own background, I'm a, by, by training, I'm, I'm in, in uh, from hail from 
public administration research and po policy studies. So it's been really, really uh, educative also to, to take part of, 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 of all the, the presentations before. Uh, I've been involved in, in, in Staffan's project since uh, 2019 uh, and before that with, with OSA uh, and uh, been uh, part of the group collecting the, the, the service. Uh, the uh, European value studies conducted uh, among the, the Swedish-speaking minority in Finland and then uh, with the uh, uh, non-residents. And, and it's, it's from, uh, uh, based on these, these uh, uh, data, as Safan just told you, that we have published, uh, uh, well, several pieces, but uh, uh, this presentation now, which reflects on, on the methodological, uh, methodological choices and uh, uh, applications. Uh, it comes from, from uh, mainly three uh, publications, uh, two already published and one under work with, with uh, Staff and, and, and Maria Beck. So, yeah. Uh, well, as a background, uh, just uh, as a motivation for, for wide study, uh, this, these are the same points put already quite much more eloquently by, by people here before me. Uh, the idea of, is, of course, to, uh, that by studying a, a, a uh, non-residents, we have the opportunity to, to see, an, a, like, a, uh, like Eva said in the first uh, uh, presentation, a, a study the shock of, of moving to a new country, and then also perhaps the, the, uh, uh, the, the re-socialization in, the in the new country, in the new uh, context. Uh, so, and also, as a, uh, like, uh, it's interesting both from, from uh, these are uh, points that are mainly uh, like general points on reflection for for motivation for study uh, non residents or, or migrants but if you especially then when you when you consider them from the point of view of the of the minority uh, speaking group uh, uh, they all uh, become perhaps uh, a bit more uh, specific and you can you can find the same questions related to the uh, with with a, with a, uh, a small of a like a like a twist for the for the Swedish speaking minority. Uh, it's uh, of course an, an uh, exaggeration to say that that we could answer fundamental questions of political science by studying the Sw Swedish speaking minority, uh, but uh, maybe we can we can inform these questions and and, and uh, we have more more uh, like uh, to to uh, looking at what we have published. We have we have looked at uh, political behavior from. Uh, point of view of, of the party tie, uh, uh, political trust, and now we're working on a piece with uh, uh, Staffan and Maria, considering uh, social trust. Um, so, as Staffan already said, uh, just by observing the uh, uh, what they what what, we, what the non-resident Swedish speakers say. Uh, we, we, we have interesting results. Uh, we can see that they have more or less the same uh, party uh, alignment as the, the uh, Finland resident Swedish speakers. On the other hand, we have, we have subjects where they have, they completely differ the political trust. Uh, they have uh, uh, like a significant level of, 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 of on, in, on average, uh, higher political trust to Finnish institutions than, than uh, resident Swedish speakers. And then the third uh, here is, is the uh, uh, social trust uh, with uh, uh, the classic question, uh, do, you, do you think people can be trusted or, or not? And, and here's the share of to the, to the, uh, uh, among the uh, Swedish speakers, non-residents non, non, non and the ones residing in Finland. And you can, you can tell from, from here that the, the, the proportion seems to be about the same. What makes things interesting and methodologically uh, challenging is, of course, that uh, people who emigrate are not the same. Uh, they are not, on average, quite different from people who stay or choose not to. Uh, so, uh, in terms of, of uh, like a research design or methodological, we have a problem of self-selection. Uh, here's just a few, uh, for example, uh, to put this more concretely, uh, people who uh, are the, the emigrated Swedish speakers uh, have much a higher share of, of, of uh, high income uh, groupings than the, the non uh, emigrant Swedish speakers. Uh, and another one uh, uh, education, 
they have they tend to have uh, they have they're more highly educated uh, than the ones who stay in Finland. And if we if we think if we if we're trying to explain uh, political behavior, uh, party alignment, uh, trust, political trust, social trust, it it's it becomes quite quickly uh, quite fast uh, apparent that these are problems that we have to consider because uh, they can also explain the uh, the uh, both the immigration and also but but also the the, the outcome. So we have, in methodological terms, we have the problem of confounding variables here uh, that we have to some way uh, treat uh, in order to, to uh, isolate the effect, what causes and what, what's, what's the effect. Traditionally or historically, in political science, the uh, methodological choice has been uh, some sort of, of uh, regression adjustment. Uh, 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 controlling for for uh, covariates uh, and specifying a model that would, in the best of world, uh, take into consideration and uh, weigh in the model the uh, uh, the these confounding variables. Uh, however, uh, it's been it's been already for it's been shown or claimed for some time that that these are. Uh, these are are uh, sus are suspect for uh, uh, various measurement measurement and specification errors that that can can render the the estimate and the causal interpretation uh, causal inference uh, problematic. So in the best of worlds, we of, of course we would have a, a random assignment of of people to to migrate and then people to stay. But uh, since this is not, not an option, uh, we have to to come 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 around a way to 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 mimic such a, a randomized controlled trial. And fortunately, there's a bunch of of uh, me methodological uh, uh, techniques to uh, to try to mimic the uh, this sort of of. Uh, randomized controlled trial, and um, the idea is that that by uh, that taking a, a, a natural experiment, that is that in our case the the people immigrating and and uh, comparing them to to uh, uh, a group of non-immigrants, that is the Finnish uh, Finland residents, and then uh, with these uh, methodologies try to uh, establish groups that are as similar as possible. So you have. Uh, in methodological terms, counterfactuals for the observations. And crudely taken, you have two different types of techniques. You have matching techniques and weighing techniques. And uh, we have applied uh, in our publications uh, two of these, one matching technique and one uh, weighing technique technique that we are working with, uh, with for the moment. The logic of, of the of the matching techniques uh, it's quite intuitive. You're trying to uh, with different uh, approaches. You're trying to to find as equal uh, observations among a group that has not received a treatment that is equal to the that the unit would be equal to to the to the one having received the treatment on all other uh, characteristics than the, the the treatment or control uh, uh, aspect. And uh, we, we can, you can you, you can do this matching by by uh, exact matching. That is the uh, uh, trying to find the exact uh, similarity uh, in between the units. Uh, this is of course uh, an ideal uh, solution, but but then quite quickly becomes very complicated to find in the real, real world uh, units that would be comparable on on all aspects that would be relevant to to consider. So another one, a more uh, practical, pragmatic uh, choice would be the, the nearest neighbor, where you try to uh, establish uh, units that would be close enough to, to the ones that, you're, that, that have received the treatment. And here's, for both these exact matching and, and nearest neighbor matching, there are different, a bunch of, of different techniques uh, that, have, uh, that apply different uh, uh, solutions for how to, to match them exactly or how to uh, decide who's, uh, who's near enough a neighbor to be considered an uh, equivalent for the, for the uh, unit having received the treatment. And our choice here uh, in, 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 in one of the papers uh, on political trust uh, was the propensity score matching, which is one of the uh, most established techniques. And the, the idea is, is 
quite intuitive. Uh, you uh, calculate uh, the propensity or the uh, probability for each unit for having received the treatment based on a few uh, covariates or conditions. And then uh, you, you uh, get a, a group of, of uh, uh, and each unit receives a, a propensity score that shows his or her uh, probability to having received the treatment, and then you uh, do match this, and then you can do based on this, you can do the, the treatment effect analysis. So you uh, you compare the ones uh, having uh, received the treatment and not having, and then you have the difference between them. And here is a, as an example. Uh, the paper on, on political trust. I first applied the linear regression uh, on on the on a uh, outcome variable having a, as, as the outcome variable having a political trust variable constructed of, of four items uh, in, in in line with with many many other uh, papers on political trust. Uh, and then, uh, as we can see here, the uh, the linear regression and the uh, PSM ATT model. Gave quite diff uh, quite quite similar uh, coefficients for the for the immigration. So uh, on average, uh, people have uh, emigrated have uh, immigration increases political trust by uh, quite a quite a significant uh, uh, number. Uh, bear in mind here that the outcome variable has been normalized between uh, to, to uh, between a range of zero and one. So uh, coefficient of, of three points, uh, point three six or point four six is quite high. So, yeah. Mm. But then, as with all methodological choices, you have problems, uh, and and with with the propensity score matching, you have the the, the uh, as with all matching techniques, you have the, the problem that you may end up with with a uh, with a control and treatment group where you have no matches. So that's why you you do a, you have to do a common support analysis or and try to figure out the the overlap in distribution and here here's the depicted the the, uh, the propensity score between the the two groups and their the, the distribution. The idea is is that uh, you have to have at least one uh, matching uh, on the uh, uh, untreated group to each each treated group. So if you have, uh, as long as uh, e even if there's even if they're not like similarly distributed, as long as you have a, 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 at least as as many in the untreated group as in the treated group, you're you're good with this method. But this this, this clearly shows that in, in the first the first common support analysis is for the political trust paper, and and here it it, it shows that there's only one one. Uh, one, 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 one unit in the treated group that didn't receive a, a similar or a close enough uh, untreated uh, unit. And, and one, one observation is, is you, you can perhaps live with that. So it probably won't, won't change the, the uh, analysis that much or the results. But then the second one here is, uh, this is from the, from the paper we're working at at the moment. Uh, uh, and, and here you can see that uh, you have a, a, a bit of a bigger uh, share of, of, uh, of treated uh, that is not on support. Uh, that, that is off support, and especially uh, people migrate. Uh, people who, uh, migrated who 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 score high uh, on their their propensity to migrate uh, have no equivalent in their in the in the in the untreated group. So perhaps you have a problem here. And I think if I recall, recall correctly, there were over 20, 20 units here of, of that are not on, on support. So. Uh, so in, in this in this situation with the propensity score matching, if you would to advance with it, you should you should do as is a custom. Uh, you should uh, rebalance or uh, cut the the uh, the population or respecify uh, the model, and then you would end up with uh, a slight over, and and you you should do this until you have enough of common support or or in the best of world no no uh, no off support at all. But this of course. Uh, it's, it's, it's both laborious. You have to do it over and over again, and then it, it becomes quite quickly it can become spurious uh, for for your decisions to uh, if you just try to enforce a, a certain a certain uh, uh, like logic or or uh, form on the groups uh, by hand. So instead, uh, in these case in these cases, 
it can be more efficient and, and also uh, methodological sound to apply a, a weighing uh, technique. And uh, as in matching techniques, there are different uh, choice or different techniques here. We have applied the entropy balancing technique, which is a uh, well, perhaps not any not that anymore new technique, but still uh, an interesting and and very effective technique for for uh, for going around the, the the problem. And it's basically the idea is with the entropy balancing technique is that you take the uh, you take the treated group as a reference group. So in our case, the, the migrants, and then you, uh, based on their uh, uh, constraints on, on a few uh, uh, certain uh, important uh, indicators, you re-specify or reweigh the or the the, uh, the, me me the model reweighs the, the control group to match them exactly uh, on these uh, specified moments. It's quite it's an elegant technique, so it 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 rescales or uh, reweights each unit uh, separately so that uh, so that the uh, that the whole group uh, on, on mean variance and skewness matches uh, uh, the, the treated group uh, and here's an, uh, an example of, of for for our paper uh, where we applied this uh, the idea is that uh, the table shows it has to, you should read it now like the the, the, the uh, from left to right, you have the first the, the untreated data, the raw data, and it shows the the uh, estimated mean uh, on these uh, covariates. And at first, in the first column, you have the the, the treated, uh, and then the untreated, and you can you can and they have the standard difference between them, and you can tell that it's quite big. And then if you if you look look at the the, the treated or like the so, uh, sorry the the weight uh, based on the entropy balancing technique, you can say that that it's almost zero or very close to zero. On, on these uh, these uh, constraint moments uh, for the whole data, so it it you could say that it, it turns the the idea of, of matching and balancing on its head. So it, it approaches the, the whole idea that okay, uh, if you if you really want to have a balanced uh, two balanced samples with balanced covariates, let's make it happen, and, and then it, it takes the treated group as the reference point and forces the same uh, covariate balance. Uh, on the on the control group so um, so as a result you have a, a, a nice perfect covariate balance and in principle then you can apply the treatment effect analysis and uh, and estimate the average treatment effect of the treated so uh, and that's the, the one of the limitations of course you can only say something about the, the treated group because that has been the reference point now and then it also uh, uh, it, it enlarges the the, uh, the uh, standardized errors, so uh, you have a, something of a like a uh, higher uncertainty in the in the in the uh, inferences and uh, the estimates. So, to conclude, uh, these are a, a few of, of the many techniques that can be applied. Uh, they are uh, we have found them useful for the purpose of of. Uh, of uh, replicating or mimicking a, a randomized controlled trial, they all come with their with their uh, limitations and drawbacks. Perhaps uh, not, none of them can be can be like uh, ultimately be uh, uh, solved or like be the, the, the uh, silver bullet for for this uh, issue, but uh, should be applied uh, in in uh, as, as robustness checks at least and and can can provide a. a uh, a, a test. Uh, many of these, even if uh, many, many of these, many of these techniques have their own uh, statistical tests uh, for, uh, that, for for coherence and, and other types. One of the uh, one of them being the, the common support assumption test that can uh, show on on uh, if, whether you have problems that can be con that can lead to confounding in the analysis. Which you regularly don't have with with uh, at least standard uh, uh, regression solutions. So yeah, um, I think I'll end there. Thank you. So are there any questions for Isaac?
So maybe you can ask him during the coffee break. Uh, is it a coffee break now, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> so, so we will have a... Well, well, when are we supposed to continue? 10-2. Ten 10-2. Ten okay. So we have a coffee break until 10-2. And if you have any questions, just ask Isaac. Do you have
Okay, is it okay if I start? Okay, hi for my part two. My name is Maria Beck and I'm with the Swedish School of Social Science at the University of Helsinki and I'm uh, quite new to this project. I all, all uh, started only uh, in uh, April, so I'm still just getting acquainted with the data and, and the methodological issues. So I won't even pretend that I understand everything that I'm talking about. Uh, if you have any detailed questions about the methods or uh, the data, I will, I'm going to refer them to my colleagues, uh, Stefan and Isak. But I will try to at least tell you something about this ongoing project that we have, or article that we're planning to write about social trust. Okay, um, now since we have uh, all this new data and, and, and this possibility, we also decided to have, the, uh, have a look at the concept of, of social trust. Now, I don't know um, how familiar you are with the theories of social trust, but you're likely to have heard about it at least to some extent since it's um, currently in, or in the past uh, couple of decades it's been used very widely to um, explain both individual uh, behavior and, and differences between countries and um, it's been said to have many many positive effects for both individuals and societies so um, it's something to take into account basically. Um, um, if we just think about social trust in general, I wasn't thinking about going very deeply into all of the um, factual or um, hypothesized effects of social trust, but at the country level it's often been said that social trust is very beneficial for um, economic and uh, democratic development. 
social cohesion, it's uh, connected to local corruption and many other uh, positive traits. And then again, at the individual level, you might have heard that it has to do with um, many kinds of things such as better health, optimism, positive life outlook, and, and so on. So many positive effects. And here, I think that while um, researchers are fairly, or there's quite a high consensus that social trust is something that is beneficial, then again, the consensus is probably not as uh, high when it comes to how should we define social trust, how should we operationalize it, how should be it be measured. So it is quite a, a, a complicated concept. I've been studying social trust for the past 15 years or so, and um, I still don't have all the answers. I guess no, nobody has all the answers, but it's very difficult to uh, grasp sometimes. Um, what can be said is that, of course, uh, whether or how we trust somebody depends on how you know them, or if you don't know them at all. So uh, a basic division is oftentimes done between particularized trust and uh, generalized trust. With particularized trust, we mean trust to, to those who we know from before and somehow. It might be our family, uh, relatives, neighbors, co-workers, and so on. And then we have uh, generalized trust, which is trust in unknown others or strangers or most people in general. Now, uh, this is <laughs> uh, how we measure generalized trust. It's quite a, a criticized concept, but it's basically how it's done. So we stick with the same measurements uh, even so. So we have these two uh, different forms of trust. But from a society point of view, uh, generalized trust is the kind of trust that has all these beneficial effects. So particularized trust may, of course, be good for those who have it at the individual level and the individuals themselves. But it's um, generalized trust that we often look to um, or have as an explanation to all these other um, positive outcomes in society and for individuals as, as well. So these two forms of trust then, um, and I'm soon getting to the point what we're doing, but basically uh, what's also been, the jury is still out when it comes to where does trust come from, especially generalized trust. How, how is it generated? And we have two basic, or we have two different schools of thought when it comes to how uh, social trust is created. Um, the first one is the cultural perspective, and I know that we've been discussing this to, to some degree earlier today, but by this we mean, or those who are the proponents of uh, this cultural perspective say that trust is something that you learn very early uh, in life, mainly through uh, parental socialization. So, so basically the, the trust that you have, you will carry on and it, it will not shift even if you move abroad. But then uh, we have this other opposing perspective, the experiential or knowledge-based um, perspective, which says that, uh, well, actually people's opinions and, and attitudes, including social trust, is something that can be influenced throughout life. And, and it's subject throughout, or it's subject to change, basically. So what we want to do with this, um, um, this paper is uh, to evaluate these two theories. Um, in this case, we can say that immigration kind of, it constitutes a, a natural experiment to the validity of these uh, two different perspectives. We may not get all the answers, but we can at least see does uh, the level of social trust change when people move abroad? So our main research question for this um, is very simple. It's basically just, does emigration affect the level of social trust? And we want to look at this from two different perspectives. We have uh, taken into account 
um, both the destination country, we have, uh, I will come back to these variables in just a moment, but we'll uh, look at whether our trust, uh, the trust of these emigrants, Finland, Swedish emigrants, will change moving to another Scandinavian country compared to moving somewhere further away from Scandinavia. And I'll get back to the rationale be behind this in a moment. And we will also look at uh, whether or not the time spent um, in the country of destination will affect um, the immigrants' uh, level of social trust. So just before proceeding, just a few things about uh, the setting that we depart from. Um, as I already mentioned, um, um, or I might not have mentioned actually, but Finland is <laughs> a very high trusting country and you can pick almost any um, country co comparison about how trust varies between different countries and you will almost always find Finland and also the other Scandinavian countries at the top of this list. So Finland as a country is a very high trusting country from the beginning and then we also have the Finland Swedes uh, who have a very high trust from the very beginning. So. Uh, the Finland Swedes have often been seen uh, kind of like a positive minority compared to many other uh, minorities um, across the world. Um, many times um, migrant or, or minority status is seen as a disadvantage. This is because, uh, uh, at least from a social, uh, social trust point of view, because facing discrimination, area of living, level of income, all of these are oftentimes uh, connected somehow to the min minority status. So, so in this case, um, the Finland Swedes, um, all by being numerically much smaller than the majority, they still um, enjoy quite a high cultural and socio uh, socioeconomic status. So, so in this case, we have this kind of a positive, I don't know if that's uh, the right term for that, but I'll just call them a positive minority. So high trusting country of origin and then a high trusting minority. What happens when they move to another country or another uh, Scandinavian country where uh, the level of trust is expected to be more or less the same as in Finland as compared to uh, if they move somewhere further away? Does distance here uh, have an effect? Now, um, the other Scandinavian countries are, of course, very similar to Finland, both when it comes to, um, well, all kinds of cultural traits and socioeconomic and demographic um, traits. So we would perhaps not um, expect much of a change in trust uh, when Finland and Swedes move to, to Scandinavia. On the other hand, uh, it's been said that social trust is something that, that is highly context dependent. Our trust is influenced uh, by the uh, surrounding context. So moving uh, to a country where the level of trust is considerably lower, for instance, would, according to the experiential, at least experiential uh, perspective, decrease this immigrants' trust. So what we want to do, we don't have, uh, when we started doing this uh, um, research, we didn't really have a set direction to our hypothesis about whether their trust will change or not because we felt that both of these theories are in fact equally plausible. So we just let the empirics show uh, which way it goes. So mainly if we find that trust does not change when moving from uh, Finland to uh, another country, well that would at least in my point of view, give some support uh, to the idea that the cultural perspective has some truth to it. That is, that you learn to trust and then it doesn't shift even if you uh, move somewhere else. Then again, trust could increase or decrease depending on where we move. So here again, this would support the experiential perspective. Um, perhaps it will increase. Now in the Finnish case and the case of the Finland Swedes, we're not likely to see an increase because the level of trust is already quite at a high level. So we are perhaps not expecting a high increase in trust. But if Finland Swedes move to a country where trust is lower than in Finland or the other Scandinavian countries, we might uh, see a decrease. 
that's kind of what we expected at least. Um, and then we do pretty much the same for time spent. We already mentioned, I think, the idea of resocialization. Somehow it could be expected perhaps that um, initial moving to somewhere else or to another country would decrease your trust in the beginning, but then um, after some, or, or increase or decrease your trust depending on where you go, and then it would come back to the original level at some point. So um, it takes some time for the people who move abroad to re-socialize into um, the new environment. So letting this be hypothesis, the direction of this hypothesis be uh, a little bit open, we decided to test uh, this design. And so what we do, I, as I said, I won't uh, go into the details of the methods and the data because that what we do is pretty much what Isaac already talked about, that is we have uh, pool data which is um, constitutes of the, uh, the diaspora survey data and the respondents to that survey are the emigrants in this study. And then we have those who are the Finland Swedish residents of Finland, uh, who are, and these respondents come from the other um, European Values Survey. So we have these two groups that we uh, try to match and see uh, whether or not these are dependent variables, if there's differences in these. And our dependent variables, we uh, have these two um, different forms of trust. The particularized form of trust, would you, I would like to ask you uh, how much you trust people from various groups. And then we decided to only take this um, category, people you know personally. And we could discuss uh, the validity of these uh, measures later, but this is how we decided to do. So this, these represent people we know from before and uh, particularized trust. And then we have uh, the standard, uh, is often called the standard question because it's basically what we often use for uh, generalized trust reading. Generally speaking, would you say that most people can be trusted or that you can never be too careful in dealing with people? And as I said, this is um, a somewhat problematic measure. Um, one could ask, for instance, is it the same thing to trust someone uh, and being careful? Are these the exact opposites on the same dimension? I would probably be inclined to say that they're not, but, but since this is the question that is often used, we decided to uh, also use this one. Then as for context, um, as I mentioned, we um, have the Scandinavian countries, um, Sweden, Denmark and Norway versus other, and this is, these are mostly, con this consists of other Nordic, um, non-Nordic Western and Anglo-American countries. Um, so perhaps uh, these are not uh, very low trusting countries. It would be interesting, of course, to see what happens to if Finland Swedes move to a very low trusting countries, but still we expect that the um, level of trust in this other group is uh, lower than it is um, in the Scandinavian countries. Also, they differ in many other ways from uh, the Scandinavian countries. And then as a second context uh, variable, we have time spent in the new country and we divided this to 10 years or less, those that have uh, migrated and spent less than 10 years and over 11 years in the country of destination. And um, as Isaac explained, and this is what we do, we try to compare um, the emigrant and resident Finland Swedes using entropy balancing. If you have any questions about that, again, um, I will refer them to Isaac afterwards. But we basically match these two groups to render them comparable. We use um, these different um, covariates or variables. We have gender, education, marital status, uh, employment, um, high level of income, which is a dummy variable, um, and then we have size of municipality and uh, language status, I've brought the proportion of, of uh, Swedish speakers or fin Finnish speakers in the municipality. 
So we basically try to make these two groups comparable using these uh, covariates. And here is our, or here are our preliminary results. And again, this is um, work very much in progress. Um, we will happily take any comments and ideas that you will, might have about this. But these are the very first, um, um, the first results. So now it's important to note that these two different forms of trust have been coded differently. While the generalized trust variable is a dichotomous variable from the beginning, so it, it takes the value 0 and 1, then the particularized trust is, is normalized. It's a four-point scale that's been normalized to vary between one and, uh, 0 and 1. So they're not entirely comparable. And we had some issues with that. So the, the analysis with the generalized trust are based on logistic regression, if I understood it correctly, Isaac. Right, yes. So they're not entirely comparable, but what you can see from here is uh, that, well, firstly, um, and perhaps a little bit uh, disappointingly, we don't see any interesting uh, results for particularized trust. Um, maybe it's not that unexpected because uh, we would not expect particularized trust to change very much because it's always subject to change because it has to do with people we know. So when you learn to know how uh, somebody, then you will evaluate whether you trust this person or not. But for generalized trust, we see some uh, interesting results. Uh, first of all, we see that for all immigrants, the first the first row over there uh, for um, all versus residents, we see um, that those who emigrate in general do uh, display lower, um, uh, a lower level of trust, generalized trust. Um, and also we see that those who um, move to a non-Nordic country uh, display uh, significantly lower trust than those who um, or move to Scandinavia. And this was a little bit what we expected, that moving to somewhere, uh, to a country which is very different from Finland, that would uh, perhaps lower um, this respondent's trust. Then for time spent in the destination country, this does mostly not affect uh, the level of trust, according to our analysis, um, only for those who have spent 10 years or less uh, is the um, ATT score uh, significant in this case. So um, we don't have any conclusive um, results perhaps yet, but we're, um, we will try to figure these out and, and also figure out what they exactly mean. So what do we uh, make out of all of this? So well, even if, if you look at these scores, we see that they are, um, the differences are quite small. Uh, we still see that uh, immigration does in fact decrease um, generalized trust for the Finland Swedes, and uh, whereas then the trust to those we know from before did not decrease uh, significantly. Um, so what do we make out of all this? Well, Perhaps this gives at least some indication of uh, the uh, experiential perspective that moving to another uh, country does in fact alter um, the level of trust. However, it becomes more problematic when we try to understand that what is it in these experiences that actually uh, matter for the Finland Swedes. We, we know that it lowers trust to some degree, but what are the causal mechanisms behind it? And this is something that we, I guess we will need to work on a little bit uh, more. And of course, as, as Isaac also said, um, and I think Stefan mentioned it, um, we need to keep in mind that the immigrants are a special group of people and uh, uh, we cannot isolate all possible causal mechanisms here. And, and we need to investigate further what it is in emigration that actually decreases trust and why. 
So um, about the reasons behind this, we can only speculate at the moment, but um, we will continue with this, uh, this work and, and see if we get any closer to also to explaining why. Um, yeah, I think I'll just wrap it up right here and uh, welcome any comments that you might have or any input. Very grateful. Thank you. So if you have any questions, feel free, and then I'll be happy to let Isaac answer them. <laughs> hey, hey, super exciting. I know I will provide some comments later, but I, I cannot sure. help myself. <laughs> uh, um, uh, really exciting, I think. Um, I, I understand that you say that no one has done this with this method. This is true, but... Uh, the basic setup is, of course, similar to Dinas and both yes. uh, the immigrants in Denmark and the Swedish yes. expatriates. Um, so if I were to review this paper, my first comment would be to replace the proper country names with variables so that you instead measure like quality of government or institutional, uh, some institutional aspect or uh, average level of social trust from the EVS in these countries uh, sure. rather than just grouping them by Scandinavian and non-Scandinavian. I think that would be sure. like, that would be, I know it will not differ that much, but it will be neater, I think. Um, and then I was wondering whether you have considered theoretically and, and or empirically to test whether there is a conditional effect between times and in what context you spend that, that time. So, of course, your experience, if you move outside, let's say, the high-trusting countries, so the longer experience you have in such a country com uh, that should theoretically decrease trust more compared to a longer experience in a more similar or in a high-trusting country. So I was just wondering, curious about that. That's a very Thank good you. comment. No, we didn't consider it, but we, we will now. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Looking forward yes. to see more yes. paper. It's very interesting. In a sense, we, we wanted to, well, not entirely replicate, but do something similar that he did in his article, where he had this um, minority, or he had immigrants from, from very low trusting countries, I don't remember exactly what it was Turkey and, and some other countries, moving to very high trusting countries, and he saw uh, a, simi uh, a very significant effect that those who moved from low trust, they become, became significantly more trusting after some time. So we will probably have to try out uh, what happens in these different contexts in terms of time and also perhaps try uh, different um, classifications of time. I don't know, but yes, I would assume still that this is something, uh, changes in, in trust is something that at least when regaining trust it will take some time, so we will have to uh, consider those, well just the, the measurement of, of time, but yeah. Good comment, thank you. We will definitely consider. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, people, I can tell you are getting tired. It's been a long day and many presentations, but one more. You can do one more, I, I assure you, and, and, or at least I hope so. Uh, so we have one last paper that we want to talk about that has been produced within the Diaspora project, and that is about uh, media consumption and how it affects political participation. And compared to the previous article, 
this is this is a co-authored piece by by Staffan and and myself. And compared to the previous article or the previous works that uh, Maria talked about, this is perhaps methodologically less sophisticated. So here we are only looking at the survey. Uh, cross-sectional survey and only to those uh, to the migrant voters or so the Swedish-speaking migrants. Um, and point of departure in this study is, of course, as we all know, that the landscape of external voting has changed significantly over the last uh, decades. Um, and the first one is what we have talked about a lot today earlier. Uh, oh. Why didn't it show? I don't know why. Um, I have a PDF. Tidigare funkar det. Aha, du har trixat med det. Ja, men vänta nu, vi måste visa. Den hade jag. Sorry. All right, I'll start over again. No, I won't. I promise I won't tell you everything that I already said. But this is about media consumption about among external voters, just so if you need the text in order to grasp that, that's and repetition is always good. All right, so why do we study this? Well, of course, uh, we think it's it's a really relevant topic to, to look into. Well, of course, because of the infringement of external voters, which has increased over the last decades. But also, if we consider the availability of information, of information about politics and, and how we process information about politics, we have very different opportunities today as, or migrate, those who migrate have very different opportunities today compared to 20 years ago to actually follow what's going on in politics in their country of origin, but also, of course, in, the, in their country of residence. So the landscape of how we process information in relation to politics has changed a lot. So communication technology has created new ways of processing information or getting access to information, and we can stay connected with our country of origin when migrating. And this might be relevant in terms of political terms and if we're interested in how information about politics actually impacts your, your uh, political behavior. Um, well, despite these developments, there is, as far as we know, relatively little research about the connection between turnout, which is our main focus of interest here, and political media consumption uh, among migrating people. So there are a few studies which I mentioned here, um, but most of these studies uh, are perhaps methodologically not very advanced, doesn't use very good quality of data, and also the results from, from these, the empirical outcomes of these studies have been pointing in a bit different directions. And so we thought that it's actually important to, to have a look on how the patterns of not news consumption but politically relevant consumption of, of information related to, well, political media consumption is, is the concept that we use, how that affects if you turn out to vote or not. And it's of course important because we would assume and we know from other types of research that information is really important. So informed voters or informed citizens are more inclined to use their right to vote. And of course information is also very useful when it comes to identifying relevant political issues, to inform yourself about politics and to, to perhaps form your political opinions and decide which party or which candidate to vote for. Uh, and this kind of information generally, well, we generally get that from, from uh, media in, in one way or another. And also if we consider that people who move abroad, they don't have the same access to information, they don't meet politicians on the street, they don't, 
learn about politics through perhaps as much through friends and family or at their workplace uh, as those who live uh, in, in the country where, where the political arena is highly relevant. So, so there is a difference in terms of how we can access information. So, so external voters, or so those having moved abroad, are more dependent on, on perhaps internet and, and getting, staying connected actively with their country of origin in order to get votes and important information, or getting information about politics that is important for them uh, to make political decisions and also to activate themselves. Um, in this paper we have three research questions that we set out to, to investigate and we formulate a number of hypotheses. So the first is a descriptive research question. So mainly looking at what sources of political media consumption are used by external voters um, um, or external citizens, because not all of them are voters, and to which extent do they devote their attention when it comes to politics to the country of origin or the country of residence. And here we, we have an hypothesis uh, saying that host country political media consumption is higher than home country political media consumption. So we would assume that people are more actively engaging or seeking out information about the context in where they actually live compared to where they come from. Um, then we have uh, an, a research question relating to the mobilizing effect of, of this information. Uh, uh, so does following politics from media have a mobilizing effect in line with what previous research has found for domestic politics? So we know that if you're actively seeking out information and, and getting information, you're more likely to turn out to vote. Do we see the same type of patterns when we look into to, uh, media consumption or political media consumption for people who move abroad? And here we have two different hypotheses. We assume that uh, home country uh, or country of residence, <laughs> political media consumption, is positively related to, sorry, home country is the country of origin. Uh, political media consumption is positively related to turnout in home country elections. Host country, where you're currently living, uh, we would assume media consumption in that context uh, not to be positively related to, to actively turning out to vote in the country of origin because that's a different type of, of news or, or political information that is really not perhaps particularly relevant for, for the election that you will participate in. And then we also look, we, one of our research questions also deals with the media format, so we are actually looking not we are asking them about how they consume, in which format they consume uh, political news. So does the media format matter for if you're mobilized or not? And here we hypothesize that uh, uh, the format of the media whereby external voters get information about politics does not matter. So we, doesn't, we don't think that it actually matters how you, what, from which source you get the information. But, the most important is that you get the information. And a few words about research design very briefly. Uh, we used a survey that was conducted in 2019 and Stefan already de described that survey so I won't dwell on that. Um, and also when it comes to the case at hand, that is the Finland Swedes, we argue that when it comes to the connection between media consumption or political media consumption and turnout, we don't think that the Finland Swedes are different than any other group. Yes, it's an interesting group of people that perhaps not, doesn't behave according to, to any other voter, but when it comes to this connection, we don't think that it's, it actually matters so much. Um, Further on the research design, so our dependent variable is the question if you voted or not, uh, and it relates then to the Finnish parliamentary election in 2019. Uh, the independent variables we, that we use is uh, how often do you follow Finnish politics or politics in the country where you're resident? And we ask about television, radio, daily papers, and social media. 
And we, we had a factor analysis to single out uh, different patterns in new consumption, but I won't go into those, uh, but that uh, helped us to, to, to uh, create our variables. We also have uh, some covariates in, in the regression analysis, just controlling for, for regular socio-demographic background factors and also uh, political engagement. All right, just looking at the descriptives, I think they are really, really actually <laughs> interesting because here we get a sense of how people living abroad consume political news. And we can see that the first one to the left that's uh, for those living abroad, the Swedish-speaking Finns living abroad, how much do they consume news about Finnish politics? And we can see that the highest staples are those to the right, which means that those who responded at never. So people don't actively seek out information about Finnish politics to a very large extent. 2% uh, says that they watch TV every day and polit consume politically relevant information from the TV every day. Radio, 1%. Newspapers a bit higher. We would assume that they, they do this online. And in social media, the, the numbers are also a bit higher. But, but many people don't actually engage at all and don't get information. Then if we ask them about uh, the share of respondents who follow politics in the country in which they are, live, their host country, uh, we see very different uh, patterns. So that's to the right, and uh, people, it's fairly an equal distribution. There are those who do not consume politically relevant information at all, uh, but there are also those who actively, every day, uh, follow politics via TV, radio, newspapers, or social media. So it's a clearly a very different distribution compared to, to those when it comes to following Finnish politics in different media. And how does this then affect turnout? Well, we actually, we find that news consumption is important, or politically relevant news consumption is important for, for turning out to vote. Uh, we can see for traditional media that if you consume, uh, that's the predicted values in the regression here, um, but the, the important thing here is to look at the slopes. So we can see to those uh, figures to the left that there, there is an upwards uh, trend here. So the more you consume traditional political media consumption in here, in this case, in Finland. So those living abroad consuming more political news in Finland, they are also more likely to vote. We can see the same pattern for the social media, which is it's weaker effect, but, but it's also a positive effect to the left. But if you consume political, political, relative, political news in your host country, that is the country, context in where you live currently, it doesn't really uh, mobilize you to vote in your country of origin, that is Finland. And this makes a lot of sense. There is even a negative effect for social media relevant political news consumption. So if you, if you get, consume um, uh, politically relevant information via social media uh, more actively in the country where you're actually living currently, then you're less likely to turn out to vote in Finnish elections. Uh, well, what we say based on this is that all of our hypotheses are at least partly supported. So we see that respondents follow host country politics more closely, especially when it comes to traditional media. So you do actually follow politics uh, or political news more in the context where you live compared to the context where you, which you come from. This is not very surprising, I think. But we also, more, most importantly, for, from this perspective, is that we confirm hypothesis two, following home country politics. Following news of politically relevant information in Finland uh, is strongly associated with turning out to vote in Finnish elections. Um, and the third hypothesis uh, is also confirmed to some extent at least, that following politics in the host country, that is the country where you're living, is not over positively related to voting in home country elections. There were some models, we, we actually ran several models and there were some exceptions here, but with the full model we, we confirmed the, the hypothesis. 
Um, it's even negative when it comes to social media, so we find a negative effect. And when it comes to the format, um, the format matters uh, following or does not matter, actually, following politics in home country media is, irrespectively of the format, is positively associated with participating in elections. But it did, it actually, the, the effect of the format in your, in your host country matters. But I think that's perhaps of less relevance for this study. Conclusions, very briefly. Uh, relevant political information, that is, political information about the context in which the election takes place and consumption of that actually matters for if you turn out to vote or not. Um, so in order to become politically engaged, we would assume that external voters, people's li people living abroad, they would actually need to engage in, in, in news consumption or, or in home country media. Uh, interesting based on this study is, of course, to discuss the generalizability of our findings. It's always difficult with a single case, and this is a very peculiar case. Um, we might think that it's mostly relevant for migrants from Western Europe, but uh, I think the main argument here is that there is no specific expectation here about Finland Swiss being different than any other migrating group uh, when it comes to the connection that we are looking into here, even though it's a peculiar group in many other senses. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Ah, there is a question. <laughs> Thank you for this interesting uh, presentation, uh, Osa. Uh, I have two questions, not one. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm wondering uh, your future research agenda. Are you thinking to continue media, uh, to continue examining media consumption with migrant electoral behavior, for instance, to incorporate what the literature uh, call as uh, dual transnational or multi uh, territorial voting, assuming that an no resident citizen can be a uh, no citizen resident in tandem. Um, and I don't remember um, this, so apologies in advance if you mention this, uh, but did you correlate interest in politics uh, with media consumption in both countries? Uh, maybe this this can be interesting to a future explorer or maybe a robustness checks. Did you ask about interaction here? Or yes. Yeah? No, we did not, okay. as far as I can recall. We did this study a, a time ago, so I can't recall all the specifics, but, but we, w of course, control for political interest in, in our models, but we didn't run any interaction of, of that, but we, that's, yeah. Yeah. And in terms of, of future explorations and digging deeper to this, um, I haven't actually given it much thought, but we, we might have a discussion about that afterwards if you, if you have any ideas. So thanks for that. Yeah, thanks. <coughs> really interesting. <coughs> um, I was wondering, um, because this kind of, this graph uh, kind of speaks quite loudly that most of the time people not not living in Finland are not that interested in Finnish politics or don't follow it so much. But if you were to think of this in terms of kind of a, a typology, <coughs> excuse me, of different kinds of respondents, were there kind of kinds of uh, respondents who were interested or who, who did follow and, and is, like, do, is there some characteristics that, that might describe that kind of group? That is an excellent question. Uh, it's clear that there is a specific, there is an active group who seek out information uh, in different types of formats. Uh, but who they are, I actually don't think that we look dig much into that, did we, Stefan? No. Ah, that was supposed to be another. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's always another article, isn't there? <laughs> uh huh. But thanks for the tip for reminding us about that other article. 
Can you go one forward? One slide forward. Mm -hmm. This one. Uh, I wonder how that would look if you would uh, consider age, because we know that uh, consumption patterns for media varies highly uh, on the basis of age. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I have to say that I don't know, but in terms of the effects on turnout. Uh, because we know that older people are more likely to vote. On the other hand, with external voters, it's more complicated because those who are older might have lived in outside of Finland for a longer time, which might also affect their propensity to vote. But when it comes to news consumption, uh, it, as you said, you're the expert on this. It, it varies heavily by, <coughs> with age and, and in in terms of access to information, I would assume that it's really, really important here, actually. So uh, I can't say anything else now than that we know that age matters a lot for both of these uh, correlations or both of these aspects which we look at here. And, and that actually might be interesting to explore further. So, so thanks for that. It feels like I never have a concrete answer to any of the questions. <laughs> this, is, this is poor <laughs> outcome. Any other questions that I don't have a, question, a response to? <laughs> no? Okay. Thank you so much. You won't need to listen to me anymore today, I promise you. Or at least not now. So we have come to the <coughs> final part of, the, of, of our program uh, and, and, and that is being sort of, that is our project being examined by our uh, external advisors. <laughs> so, so when we, when we uh, applied for this project, we also, we also, um, we also uh, inclu included an, an external advisory board to, to the project. And, and we have two members of that external advisory board present here today, and that the first one is university lecturer Maria Solovic from the University of, of Gothenburg, and, and the other one is, is, is uh, you are, uh, what's your research? Senior research, Senior research uh, at the, at the Migra Migration Institute uh, in Finland in, in Turku, Mika uh, Tervonen, and, 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 and they have graciously Promise to, to, to give some give some comments and, and feedback on, on, on the research that we have presented here today, and and they will give for, they will continue their sort of uh, cross examination yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. So uh, should we just uh, so we, should we just start? Yeah. Okay. So I have more like a couple of reflections and uh, maybe one or two crazy suggestions. Um, but first of all, congratulations uh, to the project on, and the impressive data collection efforts that you have done and also that so many papers are going to come out. Uh, I think that's really nice. Uh, I would have really liked to have, have this context, research context back in 2014 when we did the Swedish expatriate survey. At that time there was so little quantitative research on um, on expatriates and in general, and there was for sure not at all much research uh, on expatriates using a random sample. So um, we, we were basically, you know, in the dark and had to sort of invent everything <laughs> uh, on our own, or at least it felt like that. And it is so nice to see that this tradition keeps going on in additional countries and with additional uh, diaspora groups, so I'm super happy about that. 
uh, reading through some of the, uh, listening to some of the presentations and uh, also flipping through the papers, I, I realized that even though we have very nice registers in the Nordic countries, there are also problems with them. And I see that you, that you have some of those problems uh, as well, although it seems like the Finnish registers are in a little bit better shape than the, than the Swedish ones. So congratulations <laughs> uh, to that. But that said, it means that even when we have registers, it doesn't solve everything. But it's because we, there is this underreporting, perhaps, of if people inform the authorities if they leave, if they move abroad, and you have the issue with whether they register as uh, as, as a speaker of e either of the of the languages and so on. Uh, so that was more just of a. It doesn't solve everything, but it it it's uh, definitely something that is a strength uh, of, the, of the Nordic countries. I've been thinking about whether you have tried or will do like a super data file uh, where the same items and the three samples, I don't know if you have dared, you have a pairwise combinations at least, so the, um, the Finnish-Swedish non-residents and the Finnish-Swedish residents and the host country populations. If you have the, that super file, oh my god, that will be just lovely. <laughs> because. I see a lot of interesting models that you could test where even though I don't love to aggregate, um, I don't love to aggregate the survey data, but where you can uh, measure both subjectively uh, with survey responses from example the host country populations and there are also the objective measures, expert data, VDEM, COG and so on that has been mentioned, but anyway. I see this super file in front of me, so if you have uh, infrastructure money or time left, maybe that's something to, <laughs> to, contra to do. Since you have done this, what I think is a super smart move to base it on the uh, European Values Survey, uh, um, which provides a lot of comparison. Um, I guess um, uh, I um, commented earlier that I, uh, in the social trust paper that you should try to replace uh, proper names with variables and I guess that's a general comment that I see throughout the papers that you can measure context more specifically. Uh, and I also think that some of the presentations in earlier today with these uh, nice uh, but hard <laughs> uh, aggregate level data um, basis from all around the world, there are some important information there on, and you have that also in your EU27 uh, voting rights uh, sample, but you, so you can sort of actually collect this country context information from lots of sources, including sources that are uh, very close to what you are interested in, in doing. So it will be very interesting to see more, even though I know it's less variation among where the f um, Finnish, Swedish uh, non-residents live. There's less variation, even though it was uh, over 100 countries. They tend to cluster in the in the Western Europe, and so we have the consolidated democracies and high levels, s s fairly high levels of trust and um, good quality of government and so on. But it will still be interesting to see whether you could use this. Um, uh, variables on the host society contexts uh, to see whether that impacts behavior and trust. Um, I, um, if I were to throw in another thing that would be cool to do in an upcoming project, it would be, so what's the next step? When you have harmonized like these three data sources, and we have this uh, cross-sectional data sets. Well, obviously the next step is to do a panel, right? <laughs> so let's, <laughs> wouldn't that be super cool? <laughs> yeah, you know, in a couple of years or so, when you, when you have received more money for a new research project. Um, I was a bit inspired by the work of my colleague Peter Esayason that has followed uh, asylum seekers uh, uh, when they move when they come to Sweden and what happens during the asylum process. Of course, that's a very different process. Most of um, um, Finnish, Swedish, and fin uh, Swedish Finnish people they they don't need to apply for asylum, but the process of entering another country and see what happens with attitudes over time, they show that while they're waiting for the deci decision, trust in Swedish institutions is quite low, and those who are approved 
they, their trust increases and those who are re reacted, their trust decreases. So uh, of course we don't have the same situation uh, with when you are from a, a Western or industrialized country, but I think it would be interesting to see. Of course, it's their, their sample, we're all in Sweden, <laughs> while our samples or your sample is all over the world, but it would still be cool, Since especially the Swedish Finns, because they are so eager to answer. So I think that there, there is potential. Um, then I have, uh, I also think it's very nice that you have moved forward the, with the ideas for uh, causal inference and that you try to, to model this more specifically. Um, but just don't forget to have good theoretical arguments in your papers uh, too. Because I think there is, even though we don't know exactly how the things we are interested in plays out for uh, people that emigrate, we know a lot of things about political trust and media consumption and so on from from other thing from other th uh, other other sources. So I think we can really move the research forward in this uh, close merge. I also think that uh, you should try to aim higher in the publication strategy. And if I may, may be a bit upfront, stay out of frontiers. <laughs> uh, but uh, that's it. perhaps more a personal uh, note. Uh, we can dis discuss why I think so. But I think that there, especially for the papers where you pool your data sources, I think that there should be, um, that, I mean, those, uh, those uh, papers should probably be possible to publish in the, well, perhaps not the top top journals, but for sure in the in the more um, uh, up, uh, what do you say upper per perhaps twenty percent of the journals uh, in political science. Yeah, there those were some reflections though take from me. Um, congratulations again, and uh, yeah, please continue, Mika. Yeah, thank you so much, <coughs> and I I had. <coughs> Uh, several same same comments uh, yeah main, mainly of course on on the on the uh, congratulating uh, Stefan and the, the rest of the, the the group that I think it's it's been fairly short time and there has been this small thing called covid and and despite of this you you really uh, done quite versatile work uh, also them thematically so I think it's quite impressive that you already managed to to put a lot of stuff out and I also would uh, suggest that, that now that you're moving forward that kind of moving also to to kind of high ranking journals because you have a lot of stuff stuff for that. <coughs> um, yeah and, and I think that already as, as we discussed there is a lot of kind of uh, interesting new questions and comparative possibilities as well that are kind of arising from this project so so I think, and I, I'm personally looking forward to hearing this uh, about this conundrum of how on earth can political trust uh, rise when you move abroad. That's uh, very interesting. Um, yeah, um, Stefan asked this question of why should we care, which I think is always a good question for researchers to ask. Uh, I'm myself a, a, a historian of migration, uh <coughs> which means that a lot of this um, methodological expertise uh, that uh, that Maria is talking from, uh, I, I completely lack. But for me, it's it's very clear that that this um, that minorities have historically been kind of much more significant in migration history, mi migration patterns, than what their relative size is. So uh, the the um, Finland Swedes is, is a, a very good example of this. So they've been very much overrepresented, like for example, forming something like one fifth of everybody who, who moved from Finland to uh, America or one fourth of those who moved to Sweden. So this is a, a, a pretty big issue and I think it's under researched and under theorized. So in this sense, I, I really applaud this, this, uh, this project, uh, maybe a, a little shameless uh, self-promotion. Um, so we, we got a book out called by Mr. Tmuta in uh, Migrants as Minorities that will be translated to, to Swedish this year. And in that also will we'll quite quite a lot be stuff about uh, the, the, <coughs> the Finland Swedes, particularly in Sweden. Um, 
Yeah, um, I also wanted to share this little anecdote uh, that uh, I mentioned 1920s as uh, the, the, the first decade where we can find survey studies of, of Finnish immigrants and this study in 1920 by Johannes Nasse actually was about Finland Swiss in, in US. So you are, your, your project is kind of in a line of, of long tradition, that's to say. Okay, but I just make a, a, a few um, <coughs> questions now in the end, not really comments because I haven't had really in-depth possibility to look at your material yet. But uh, a few questions that might just betray my kind of methodological ignorance, but I was thinking about um, um <coughs> uh, first question uh, deals with the elections in the country of residence. So I know that this kind of voting abroad uh, was maybe not the primary focus, but I was just interested if you have um, um, if you have uh, um, information on kind of on a party level of which parties uh, those who are eligible to vote for example in Sweden are voting so just as a question uh, and I think um, um, for example I, I know that this morning there was talk about uh, anti-establishment politics uh, and, and I know that that for example Finns abroad more generally uh, that that there has been some research on Finns living in Sweden voting for Sveria Demokraterna, for example. So it would be really fascinating to see if there is something that that uh, comparable uh, with the with the Finland Swedes abroad. Um, <coughs> um, yeah, the s the second question I, w I was thinking about this political participation as a kind of a broader category. Uh, so not just voting, uh, which of course is is uh, has this benefit that that you can actually track it very carefully but but um so just a, a question of of how much you um were asking also about let's let's say associations or online activisms uh, or or kind of minority activism so this is also something that comes out in the kind of history of minorities moving abroad that often it's not only physical mobility, but they also become politically mobilized. So, for example, I think Finnish minority politics uh, is actually very transnational in many ways. So, so just as a question as well, um, um, to to what extent you can say things from your data about other kinds of political participation. Um, <coughs> and the last question or point is uh, maybe a little bit blurry, but um, <coughs> it relates to this Utlands Finland Svenskana as kind of a minority political construct. Uh, a little bit, so this Finland Swedes abroad. So this is a little bit comparable to, to uh, Finns abroad, which is also a kind of a, a political construct that has a, a kind of a curious history. Uh, and it's not always so clear uh, in this case who is a Finn abroad. Um, <coughs> so, so in a research that we did last year, we we had to be facing a lot of these questions of of people that we are studying, that a lot of the time they are, for example, double citizens or triple citizens. Uh, often the families are multilingual. So, 70% of the families that we we got material from, uh, the the spouse was um, a citizen of another country. Uh, also, there is there was a lot of kind of minorities within minor minorities and kind of contested. Uh, um, identifications with these. Um, also, there was a lot of circular patterns of migration, short-term patterns of migration. So then we had to face this question uh, in our research um, <coughs> of who actually is this Finn abroad. So I was just curious about to what extent this is something that you have been kind of um, uh, facing in your research. Um, and also because this co ties up with Isaac's question of, of uh, self-selection uh, bias. So kind of who are we missing? Uh, are, there, are there groups and people that, that we kind of know that we are missing? Uh, are there somebody that we are kind of sus sus suspecting that, that we miss? Uh, and what kind of uh, methodological implications that might have? So th I'm just kind of thinking aloud. So that's it from me, but other, other than that, I've, I, I just want to thank you for a really fascinating seminar and I learned a lot.
and yes, all the best for the, the rest of the... Yeah, and I have an explanation for the high trust. If, it's, if this is in, in politics, if it's driven by the uh, Finnish Swedish uh, people living in Sweden, probably they just think Finnish politics is terrific after having witnessed the, the government crisis after the 2018 election. So maybe it's just, just a comparison of that, uh, that the, the, the host country is basically worse. Just <laughs> and also reflecting what we just had the other day with almost another uh, government crisis. So yes. <laughs> and just to add to that, uh, something we already discussed a bit on the on the coffee that I think also the the results on trust might be quite different if you had done the sampling half a year later during the corona. So so that's that's an open question as well. I think we're running up over time here already, but uh, uh, great, great comments and, 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 and questions. Uh, and, and I think that yeah, many things that we haven't thought about, like a super data file, yes, <laughs> if, if you would have had the energy and time. <laughs> that, that, uh, that was an early plan. Uh, panel data, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, but yeah, uh, things things worth think, thinking about. I would say aim for a higher publication strategy. Yes, this is also what we uh, we we kind of think that this is great again. We should aim higher. The the thing is that the, where we where we start to trip is where we think it's like the complexity of it all. Since we have this minority group and we have migration, and and and, and we look at political behavior. So 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 we have tried uh, some some different journals. Maybe not the one. Um, like uh, all, we haven't tried all high-level <laughs> high journals, but but depending on where you go, if you go to more migration, they don't sort of s see the sort of political science point of it because then it's they are interested in different things, or that's what it tends to be like. When you go political science, they aren't that interested in in the migration point, and then you always have the minority uh, issue that you need to explain at least for some of the papers that where it's not as obvious. So it's that makes it more challenging than I think the data in itself. So that's, that makes the difficult sell. Then we haven't always aimed the highest. That that has also. <laughs> uh, so we have, uh, and and it's like for example, Frontier for Political Science. That's through a collaboration with another colleague, and 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 and, and so so th that's that's why we chose that, uh, uh, or or Isaac did that, and uh, and so forth. So so there's explanations for it. We will we will aim higher in the future. <laughs> Um, mm. uh, there was uh, like something on the part choice of non-resident citizens. I, I showed something. I, I, I think that they, they will. This will be the Swedish People's Party wherever we go. There are probably some differences between countries. I'm, 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 I'm sure we haven't. I, we probably looked at it maybe for that one paper to some extent. But yeah, nothing radical. Uh, uh, Associations, activity in associations, other types of political participation. That is actually something that we should be thinking more about. We are, we, are, we should write a special issue article about uh, other types of political participation. So, but we haven't really gotten around to that yet. But, but that's something we want to look in. It's also a bit more complicated question because that, that is not as obvious sort of immigrant issue. It's are, are they more than immigrants when they are there and, and being politically active? in other ways, but that's something we, we have data on. And, and finally, the identity. Uh, we have thought about it, and we, I think we promised it in the research plan that we we're going to do something about identity. We have some questions where we can sort of tease it out. We haven't done any work on it. That's, uh, I really have to so we have, uh, for example, quite multifaceted questions on what languages, languages they use, so, so, so they can so that's something we can look into, and, and also other types of identities, sort of what they identify with Finland, uh, Swedish-speaking parts of Finland, and so forth. So, so it's uh, yeah, we we have thoughts about these questions, but not enough. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> for our part as well and I just want to thank everyone both from the Mobile EU project and, and
and uh, and from from our project and, and everyone particip participating both here and and, and online. It's been a great day for us working with the with the projects and getting feedback and, and an opportunity to present our research. Thank you.